All right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Los Angeles City Council Chambers. Uh, this is the regularly scheduled meeting of Los Angeles City Council's Planning and Land Use Management Committee. We can be begin our proceedings this afternoon by calling the roll. Mr. Mejia? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Present. Mr. Lee. Present. Ms. Jaroslawski. Uh, absent. Ms. Padilla. Ms. Padilla. Ms. Padilla. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hutt. Absent. So that's three members in a quorum. All right. Um, we will uh, begin this meeting as we do every meeting of this committee, and that is by taking public comment. Uh, we'll take public comment from as many speakers as we can here in the chambers. Uh, after that, we'll move through agenda items uh, one at a time. I will note for the record at this moment, uh, we have in excess of 125 people signed up for public comment. Uh, I think we're going to have public comment for uh, 90 minutes or less today. Uh, so we've asked folks, if you're with a group or organization or a set of uh, folks and you all decide to come up together and give testimony, that helps us all uh, get through this meeting. We are at bare quorum now and will likely lose quorum um, somewhere uh, after 4.30. So we are going to try to execute this meeting in as exposition of fa a fashion as we can and dispose of the business that is before us. Uh, with that, I'll ask that instructions and rules for public comment be read into the record at this moment. Thank you, sir. Appellants and or the representatives and applicants and or the representatives will be allowed to speak for a total of three minutes per side unless otherwise noted by the chair. Members of the public wishing to speak on one agenda item only shall have an opportunity to speak for one minute. Appellants and applicants will be given an opportunity to speak when their item is called. Each appellant and applicant has a total of three minutes to speak. An appellant can choose to have a single representative speak on his or her behalf or divide the three minutes among his or her team. Anyone else, including an attorney or project manager wishing to speak on an appellant's behalf who does not do so during this three minute period may offer a minute of public comment whenever the committee chairperson opens the public comment period for the meeting, which is usually at the beginning of the meeting. Therefore, we expect that appellants and applicants have their respective teams assembled and ready to present at the appropriate times today. Members of the public wishing to speak on one on more than one item shall state that and shall be allowed to speak for a total of two minutes. Failure to submit public comment in a timely manner before the comment period for the item ends results in forfeiture of the opportunity to participate in public comment for the item. Mr. Chair, if I may for the record, a community impact statement has submitted for item number nine by the Valley Village Neighborhood Council against the matter unless amended and a community impact statement has been submitted for item number 10 by the historic Highland Park Neighborhood Council against the, mat against the matter. Madam City Attorney, please provide additional guidance on the public comment. Adrian Corazani, City Attorney's Office. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you are not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you're speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning. If you do not immediately get clearly on topic, or if you stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. We will inform you when your time is up. All right, with that, we'll go to public comment. Again, uh, remember, if you're with a group, it's ideal if your group comes up together. Uh, and we are going to try to make sure we get within the time allotted for public comment uh, that we hear both uh, supporters and opposition of the various items uh, before with before us uh, so with that uh, I'll ask staff to um, well before I do that I want to uh, make sure from Department of City Planning or any council offices there are no amendments to items come on up to the table if you have them. Uh, 
Um, this is Helen Campbell, Planning Director for Council District 1, Council Member says Hernandez's office. Uh, we do have an amendment for item 10, um, just a really short amendment, and we submitted a letter for the record explaining the amendment, but we uh, propose to remove site FF04 from our Council District, um, from the TCN structures, just because uh, it's going to create, um, there's going to be residential uses on it, and we didn't find that Metro provided a clear pathway for removing the structure in the future, so we propose to remove it now. We also recommend that the funding from the TCN structures be prioritized to be invested in communities that bear the brunt of the impact, and so we're recommending a half mile buffer for prioritization of the funds. All right, and uh, Mr. Mejia has a copy of this Do you have yes. amendment? Not yet. Uh, okay. And Department of City Planning, I believe we may have uh, amendments, I believe, items 9, 10, and 16. I'm looking at staff to see. So um, I see Melina Sotsadi in for item 16. Howard. Good afternoon, Council Members. Emma Howard, Director of Community Development and Planning for Council District 13. We have requested amendments for items number 8 and items number 10. For item number 8, which is the historic cultural monument known as the complex, uh, we received requested amendment language from the applicant, uh, sorry, from the property owner. Uh, which has been reviewed by the Office of Historic Resources and the nominator, the LA Conservancy. And this language reads, the nomination shall exclude interior demising and partition walls in order to provide flexibility in reusing the building. And that language has been submitted to Plum. And for item number 10, uh, we wanted to note our office's support of the CPC's removal of freeway facing sign number 13. And we have um, a request for removal of two more non-freeway facing signs. Uh, these were referenced in the November 6, 2023 letter from Shepard Mullen, the representatives to the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority on the TCN ordinance. Uh, so we appreciate their non-objection. And those two signs are non-freeway facing sign number one, located at Vermont Avenue, just north of Sunset Boulevard, and non-freeway facing sign number 20, located at the southwest corner of Vermont Avenue and Santa Monica Boulevard. We respectfully ask the Plum Committee amend that ordinance to remove those two signs. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure we, we got those, Mr. Mejia? Yes, I have the letter. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon, honorable council members, Michelle Majid, Deputy Chief of Staff for Council District 4, Council Member Nithya Rahman. We have amendments for item 16. Um, so the language we are proposing should read as follows. Amend condition 20 by adding subsection H to read as follows. The school shall allow individuals access to field B, including the track from 7 a.m. to 12 p.m. year round, except between the months of June, July, and August when they are in use by the school for camps. The applicant may require individuals to execute an annual liability waiver and conduct a background check to grant access to field B. Amend condition 18, subsection C6, uh, to read as follows. Swimming pool for members of pre-approved swim programs and individuals when not in use by the school, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. weekdays except between the months of June, July, and August when they are in use by the school for camp. However, the school may in its discretion expand public hours of use for the swimming pool to up to 8 p.m. daily. The applicant may require individuals to execute an annual liability waiver and conduct a background check to grant access to the swimming pool. Amend condition 18, subsection A5 to read as follows. On federal holidays, school activities, athletic or otherwise, are limited to indoor use only and can occur from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Add a new condition confirming no Olympic-related events, including athletic games or otherwise, at the project site. Uh, all of these have been um, supported by the applicant, and everyone has a copy of the letter. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, uh, for the record, uh, just wanted to state that Ms. Yaroslavsky has joined the meeting. Okay, and Ms. Hutt has joined the meeting as well. Oh, and Ms. Hutt as well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have five members. All right, we're all set. Thank you, Mr. Mia. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. This is Melina Session with the Department of City Planning. Um, for item number 16, there are c corrections to three of the conditions which were submitted by staff in the appeal response report dated November 1st, 2023, and those are submitted in the council file. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, uh, Council Member Yaroslavsky. Thank you very much. I'd like to also introduce an amendment to item number 10 um, to call for the removal of sign NFF7 and the removal of the other signs as requested by other council offices. Uh, two, uh, to require vertical louvers on all of the TCN signs listed in planning's November 1, 2023 letter, which includes, among others, FF26 and FF28. Uh, three, uh, to limit hours of operation for the program to be from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Four, to increase the spacing requirement from the center line of scenic highways to 500 feet. And five, um, regarding the removal of existing signs for freeway facing signs, require an initial removal of 50 static offsite sign faces before the issuance of any approval for a freeway facing sign. Then remove a minimum of four existing offsite signs within the city boundary for each new TCN structure and prioritize these spatially in the same way as they are for non freeway facing signs. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've got other amendments. Mr. Uh, Mahan. There is a letter that was submitted by Council District 2 for the TCN project. And I do recall that that letter <coughs> indicates uh, slight revisions. I don't know if there's someone from CD2 here present. No, OK. Um, if you like, uh, Councilman, I can, uh, they're very specific changes. I don't know if you want me to read them or just reference the well, letter. What, what, whatever we're required to do in order to consider them. Okay, so the, the changes uh, recommended by CD2 um, include the following uh, changes as to the distance requirements uh, from uh, there, the, it states basically the distance between signs on highways should be 1,500 feet, a 50% increase uh, than the 1,000 feet that was previously recommended, uh, and and then generally remove certain signage uh, as stated in the letter by Council President Krikorian dated November 6, 2023. All right, any other amendments? I think there's an amendment from Council District 8. For, for, for the alfresco, I think. No, 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 well, yes, for the alfresco. Yes. Uh, let me uh, read those. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. okay, so for the alfresco, um, the recommendation will be uh, to continue the item in committee with the following uh, additional instructions. Instruct the planning department and the Department of Building and Safety to post a city issue identification in the outdoor dining area and to make it clearly visible to the public indicating that the area is subject to the standards of the alfresco ordinance to provide a contact information slash hotline phone number for building and safety code enforcement after our complaints and our concerns regarding the operation of the outdoor dining area and include 311 as the phone number to call during business hours and to create a database of complaints based on address, addresses alfres um, for the alfresco establishment. And two, instruct the Department of Planning um, and along with the city attorney's office and relevant departments to report back on the alfresco establishments and allo allo allotment of handicapped parking, including feasibility of revising the ordinance to include parking spaces for people with disabilities. And in addition, um, for building and safety and planning to report back on outdoor dining area standards, why changes in the draft ordinances uh, become more restrictive and what are, op what are options 
for an appropriate nuance balance between protecting the small business owners running the restaurants and their neighbors, to also report back on the background music, music allowance, how can uh, it be ensured that the process uh, that is established for background music is not unnecessarily burdensome to responsible restaurants, and to also report back on how uh, it can be ensured that the ordinance appropriately addresses these concerns. All right, thank you. Uh, going once, <laughs> twice, I think that's all of our uh, amendments. Now we can go to uh, public comment. And uh, for folks who are interested, public comment will not go beyond 4 o'clock this afternoon. It doesn't have to go that long, but it will not go past 4. <laughs> We can't hear you. Council member. Testing, testing. There you go. All right. I will cite by calling a few names. We are asking that appellants and applicants wait until the item is before us to speak. So if I call your name and you're an applicant or appellant, please wait until we get to the item. Victor Reyes, Adele Slaughter. Jennifer Lung, Jody Pledgeman, Matthew Hess, Robin Small, Tim Hyde, Yvonne Garincher. Council member, before we start, Council member Harris Dawson. Council member. Sorry, Adrian Corisani, City Attorney's yes. Office. For the record, is anything going to be continued before speakers start speaking on any items? Very good question. There's a recommendation to uh, continue item number one. And item nine. number nine. Um, I, I'll need to call the roll, Mr. You need to call the roll. Yeah, to continue. It's been that long. Okay. To continue those items. Yes. Yes. For the record. Okay. So item one is being continued to January 16, 2024, and item nine is. Um, let me see here. Uh, I don't think that there's a specific date for item nine. To be determined. Uh, to be determined. So I will call the roll on those two. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson? Yes. Mr. Lee? Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky? Yes. Ms. Padilla? Yes. Ms. Hutt? Aye. Uh, that's fine, member. Those items are continued, sir. All right, so we can continue with public comment. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Victor Reyes, and I'm here on behalf of VICA, the Valley Industry and Commerce Association. I'm here to speak on items 10 and 16. With regards to item 10, we support LA Metro's transportation communication network and urge the PLEM committee to, to approve this program. The TCN offered by Metro promises to enhance the efficiency of our roadways, increase public transit ridership, improve public safety, and generate revenue for transportation initiatives. It will significantly enhance the experience of bus riders by providing transit signal priority, providing bus Wi-Fi, and sharing bus time information live with, our, uh, with the passengers. Additionally, the TCN can assist in managing congestion data from various hotspot locations throughout the county and the city, including LAX, SoFi Stadium, and Dodger Stadium, amongst other venues. On item number 16, we express our support for the Harvard-Westlake River Park project, which will provide both athletic and recreational opportunities for students and the community. Harvard-Westlake is aware of the importance of preserving the Weddington Golf Site, and that is why they have uh, made it a commitment as a principal to work with the various stakeholders within the community. Uh, it's for these important reasons that we ask for your support on these various projects and initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, my name is Adele Slaughter and I'm here to speak on item 10 and 16. Um, I oppose digital billboards um, as they fail to give the City Council authority to mitigate impacts 
on the visual environment, on residential and other properties, and they are dangerous to drivers and other hazards like that. I would like to move, um, I'm also the chair of the Studio City Neighborhood Council Sustainability Committee, and I'm speaking for myself today to convey a motion that my committee passed yesterday to be sent to our full board for a vote. The, mo the committee's motion requests the City of LA and Harvard Westlake to comply with CEQA's requirement for an environmentally superior alternative to the River Park project. To that end, we support Angelinos for Trees' sustainable hybrid plan, which removes Field B and preserves approximately 75% of the Harvard Westlake plan, thus meeting their stated objectives while preserving open green space adjacent to the LA River and the Zev Yaroslavsky uh, Greenway. This alternative project will preserve over 106 trees, help offset the carbon created by the development, and, open, and the open space park will benefit wildlife and the public alike. Not, not to mention their kids, a place for them to go and dream. You have this plan in your response to the DEIR. We ask that the committee amend this project today to include this hybrid plan, confirming the city's commitment to reversing the impacts of increasing heat and climate change. Thank you for listening to me, and I have copies of the hybrid plan for the committee members. May I give them to the clerk? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Robin Small, and I raised my family in Studio City. My son played golf at Weddington, and I care deeply about Studio City, and it's time to expand opportunities to more of the community. Therefore, I'm proud to support Harvard Westlake and River Park. Many are concerned that the construction will result in the loss of trees but they're wrong. The existing old growth perimeter trees will remain in the, to preserve the look and feel of the property. The trees will be removed are Mexican fan palms, non-native and invasive. These trees will be replaced with more than 150 additional trees than exist now. These new and additional trees will be environmentally appropriate, offering greater shade and consuming less water. People living in around Studio City will surely benefit from River Park but so will the birds and the wildlife because of the increased diversity. As a result of Harvard Westlake River Park, the future has infinite possibilities for all creatures, great and small. Please approve River Park. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jody Flegman. I'm here to speak on item 16. I live near Weddington and I support Harvard Westlake and the River Park. Harvard Westlake has repeatedly demonstrated a willingness to listen to the concerns of the community and take steps to lessen potential impacts from its River Park proposal. They have reduced the size of the gymnasium, agreed to prohibit visitors from parking on neighborhood streets, relocated their athletic fields to be further away from neighborhood homes and retain character defining features of the site such as the golf ball shaped lights for starters. And now in the final environmental impact report they have taken additional steps to address concerns by reducing the number of light poles and designing them to be more efficient. Lowering the bleacher seating capacity, decreasing the number of on-site parking spaces and redesigning the pool canopy so that it is both more efficient and less visible. I, for one, am immensely appreciative of these moves and would hope that my neighbors would be also. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we'll have a community impact statement from Angela. Good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of the Historic Highland Park Neighborhood Council. I currently serve as our president. Um, my name is Angela Gonzalez Torres. And I would just like to state that the uh, board voted at its October 5th meeting to submit the community impact statement in opposition to the digital offsite signs, the outdoor advertising, um, also called TCN. The HHPNC concludes that there is not sufficient evidence that this project is necessary or that it will benefit residents of Los Angeles. 
In fact, we are concerned that on the contrary, or to the contrary, this project could present a, a danger to motorists and pedestrians, have a negative impact on our historical resources and negative Im negatively impact the well-being of our residents and wildlife. Um, the DEIR was biased in favor of the project and inadequately addressed the significant, Im the significant impacts from it. Um, I'd like to just share just one example. Um, the Appendix K called the Transportation and Tra Traffic Safety Review Cherry picked three studies, two of which were in industry sponsored. Um, we are concerned that none of these studies looked at larger cities like Los Angeles where traffic is well known and documented and where a significant portion of the population uses a primary language other than English. In fact, in our community, a third of our residents are Spanish speakers only. This is why that we joined nearly 20 other neighborhood councils to submit a letter in opposition Recent research continues to show that the drivers most susceptible to unsafe levels of distraction from roadside billboards are the young who are more prone to distraction and the elderly who are more difficult, uh, have more difficulty with rapidly shifting attention. Um, we found that there's a concern for public safety being also that there's a rise in technology in our cars and cell phones um, and that this will also impact the health of not only residents but to our wildlife. We are concerned that we have cumulative impacts um, projected from this project will, which have not been fully addressed including light pollution which will impact some of our most impacted residents and communities of color who often live closest to transportation corridors. Um, further, we just encourage you to reject this proposal. I know there was a bunch of amendments here today, which I have some, but I'm running out of time. Um, and just, yeah, we just proposed the, the full rejection of the proposal on the basis of public safety, health, and well-being, not only to our residents, but also to our wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. I'm sorry, Hi. hold on. Is there someone sitting in the uh, passageway on the ground? That person has to get up and take a seat. Sir, I asked for reasonable accommodations, and you have a whole row of seats, and I'm not being accommodated to sit with my service dog. No. You're gonna, you're gonna follow the instruction. You're gonna follow the instructions of the officers, and you're going to do it. You're going to follow. You're going to follow the instructions of the officers, and you're going to do it quietly. The one closest to you. Where? Where, where? Back there? You sure to see? See this door. All right. Please state your name and the item you're speaking on. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Leung and I'm speaking on the item number 16. Um, I've been living in Council District 4 for 16 years and I support the Harvard Westlake River Park project. I have witnessed the various community partnerships that Harvard Westlake has created around the site. Groups such as Special Olympics, Angel City Sports, and Friends of LA River will be able to use the River Park site to offer programs to the community ensuring public access to thousands of people who don't currently attend the school. Harvard Westlake is setting a model for the sort of public benefit work that other private institutions ought to follow. Please approve River Park. Hi, my name is Yvonne Gerencher. I'm a San Fernando Valley native and have lived and raised our family in Studio City on Laurel Grove Avenue, just four blocks from the River Park Project for over 15 years. We love Studio City. I remember the lawn signs going up in our neighborhood years ago, opposing the development of condos on the present day golf course. We too had a lawn sign on our property as we didn't think that condos was the best use of land. Since we have lived in Studio City, there were no offers to buy the property that would maintain the golf course or turn it into a public park. 
Unfortunately, the reality is that the golf course is no longer a viable business. I believe the River Park project is a wonderful use of land and a far better option than the condos. I'm here today as your neighbor to express my full support for the River Park project. There are so many great things about the project, the solar panels, rainwater collection, native trees, but I'm especially excited to have a safe walking path. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker. Alejandro Hernandez, Clayton Frey, Danny Sio, Grace Tang, Gentle Phoenix. Please line up to your left-hand side. Tell us your name and the items you're speaking on. Um, good afternoon. My name is Matthew Hess, and I'm here to speak in support of the Harvard Westlake River Park Project. Um, I'd just like to make three points to the committee today, if I may. First, um, let's just address the subtext right off the bat. Harvard Westlake, school for rich kids, um, you know, people who are privileged used to getting what they want. Um, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, I spent every cent I had sending my kids to Harvard Westlake but I didn't have enough. Um, the school was very generous with financial aid and they allowed my kids to go there just like any other student. So not everybody associated with the school is privileged. Secondly, Harvard Westlake is going to make a third of the property, which is now closed to the public, freely available to the public 24 hours a day to be a good neighbor. Finally, Seventh graders shouldn't be attending sports, sports practice until 9 p.m. I hope the council approves the project because it'll really help the kids. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. <coughs> Hello, thank you. This is not an easy job. My name's Tim Hyde, and I live behind Harvard Westlake in Studio City, and I've lived there for 27 years. I'm here to support the project, and I also want to say my kids also received financial aid at Harvard Westlake. All the schools in Studio City and Sherman Oaks are economic engines, and we should support their growth and expansion when needed. I'm here as a neighbor to say I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Grace. I support River Park. Harvard Westlake has spent the last five years working on a transformational project. The Harvard Westlake River Park will be a state-of-the-art, 16-acre athletic and educational facility located in Studio City, just a short walk from the upper school campus. The plans for the River Park include two athletic fields, one with a track around it, a gymnasium complex, a swimming pool, eight tennis courts, underground parking, and environmental features such as a stormwater reclamation system, solar power, Solar, uh, solar power and extensive native landscaping. Harvard Westlake is committed to sharing this remarkable facility with local school children, community groups, nearby residents, and organizational partners such as Special Olympics and Friends of LA River. Please join me in supporting this worthy project. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon, and thank you, council members. <clears throat> My name is Danny So, an alum of the school. I strongly support the River Park project. Six years ago, the school purchased the property, and for six years, the plans incorporated community input. Undoubtedly, the school would have wanted more, and the neighbors would have wanted less. But this plan represents a compromise. In fact, I would say the city should use this project to set environmental precedent for future projects. Thus, I urge the committee to vote in favor of River Park. Thank you. Thank you. I will call a few more names. Mary Riley, Stephanie Granado, Terry Austin, Barbara Brody, Bart Reed. My name is Clayton Freck. I'm speaking today in behalf of, in support of the Harvard Westlake River Park Project, item 16 on your agenda. 
I'm the CEO and founder of Angel City Sports, an LA nonprofit that provides year-round access to coaching, equipment, and competitive opportunities for kids, adults, and veterans living with physical disabilities. We offer 150 clinics across 20 sports every year. We serve 15% of the population that has a physical disability. That's 600,000 people in the city of LA alone. We are in the business of changing lives through sport, building community, and creating a sense of belonging. But we cannot do this without partners like Harvard Westlake. In fact, with Harvard Westlake's support, we've grown our programming significantly over the last couple years. And with River Park being a fully accessible sports venue, we'll be able to massively increase programming, better serve the community, and make Los Angeles proud. On behalf of Angel City and all of our athletes, I wholeheartedly support the River Park Project. Thank you, Speaker. Please state your name and the item you're speaking on. Hi, my name is Gentle Phoenix. I'm speaking on item 16. Um, I'm here to tell you that this is not a good project. It's not a good idea. Uh, it has nothing to do with Harvard Westlake and what they want to do. That's wonderful. But the place, the, the piece of property that is Weddington is, um, it's, it's unbelievable. If you haven't been there and you say yes to destroying it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sad for you because this place is a gem. It's like nothing, you, nothing you've seen before. You walk around there and it just, you feel more peace just by being there. Our environment is in a state of emergency. The last thing we need to be doing is adding to the stress that is on our environment. The trees that they kill, they will pulverize. Now, pulverizing it releases immediately all the carbon that those trees have been storing for all those years, all the pollutants that have been there. It'll be immediate irreparable harm. Please don't let that happen on your watch. Don't let that destroy our environment worse than it is. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I'm Terry Austin, and I'm here to speak on public comment and item 16. Can you tell me, do I get two minutes? Hello? One minute for both items. Yeah, two yeah. minutes. Two minutes? Your, Before your, I, clock is, your clock is running. It's there on the desk. Uh, may I ask if the council members have the handout I gave of the two maps uh, for item 16? Yes, okay. if you and so my public comment is about the CEQA process, uh, or rather the PLUM meetings in general. To have a, a, a meeting on a subject that involves so many, hundreds of thousands of Angelinos, and have this meeting at 2 p.m. in the middle of the week makes it incredibly difficult if you are a regular person going to a regular job or you have small children at home. I think that when projects like this that are so large and affect so many people, that special uh, accommodation should be made for weekends or evenings or meetings that start in the late afternoon and run into the wee evening. Because all you're going to hear from is from people who can afford to come down here and retired people and older people like myself. And that's kind of unfair. Um, about item 16, um, what the map I handed out on the top shows you the the uh, design plan that was submitted three and a half years ago to the city. And the second map shows you, if Ms. Padilla can look at it, because, and Mr. Lee, because this is your district, um, this is the revised map in August 24. And it's supposed to be all the accommodations and um, modifications made. I would, I would ask you to look at both maps. There is no difference. There has been no compromise. This project is as large north to south, east to west, as it was when it was submitted. The compromise has been just um, a, a little bit here and there. Ms. Padilla, I'll tell you, in your district, hundreds of thousands of people are not going to have access to a facility that for $10 you can play a bucket of balls. It's cheaper than going to a movie. This is the 1% of the 1% asking to take the largest last 16 acres of open space in our neighborhood. Please, you've got another plum meeting before the end of the year. Please take a hard look at this project. Let Go back to the drawing board and come up with something for everyone, not the 1% of the 1%. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Speaker. Please state your name and the items you're speaking on. Um, my name is Mary Riley. I'm speaking on item 16. 
um, honorable council members, please uphold the appeals and deny this Harvard Westlake project. Um, the project's southerly access is not compatible with Fire Station 78. The main access way is a stone's throw away from the fire station driveways. The design should be changed to use the new stoplights at Witsit and Valley Spring. Please protect the firefighters from this unnecessary conflicting traffic. This project is a third campus, is a third campus and consolidates athletic facilities in campuses located in CD5 and CD4. Yet EIR fails to look at the whole of the action and ignores what will happen to those existing redundant athletic facilities in violation of CEQA. The EIR project description fails to discuss the impacts of over 15 nonprofits that have been given rights to use the project. Wonderful uses from Boys and Girls Club to the Southern California Special Olympics. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Granado. I've lived in CD4 for 20 years. I vote regularly in CD4 and city elections. I'm here speaking on item uh, public comment and 16. I wholly support the River Park as a way to evolve and improve the space for the public good. We all know change can be scary. I've heard lots of fear expressed on calls and in meetings about the River Park. I've heard some concern because the funding is coming from private sources that some people may not approve of. But the reality is the city lacks the funds and the resources to create and maintain green spaces. There are not enough maintained and secure green spaces in Los Angeles, especially for school children. Harvard Westlake has committed to share this beautiful space with school children from across the city as well as community groups and local residents. All around this city, I see high rises going up with no parking and no green space. This could so easily have been the fate of the space in Studio City. Green spaces are essential for our well being and mental health. The River Park will be a phenomenal place that's accessible to the public. It's a breath of fresh air and responsible stewardship. It is an unprecedented opportunity to create a space with significant quality of life benefits for the public. For these reasons, I strongly support the River Park and I urge you to support it as well. Thank you. Sam Huthisnanen, Susanna Vittori, Amy Smith, Carrie Sanford, Hal Brody, Jessica Graham, Lewis Sanford. Please line up to the left side. Thank you. Hello, I'm here to represent Westside Neighborhood Council. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Barbara Brody. I'm here to represent my council and to speak in opposition to the TCN program. We are one of 22 neighborhood councils across the city who've joined with community and environmental organizations to oppose the program. We're grateful for efforts to remove signs and to create better regulations, but it's still a pig that we're putting lipstick on. We have had experience living in our neighborhood council area, and some of the things we considered when we voted to oppose this program are based on our experiences living with many digital signs that were erected under the now court-rendered illegal secret billboard settlement agreements. Those billboards brought terrible impacts on neighborhoods and on people living in homes, apartments, and condominiums near them. They had a 24-7 digital sunrise with light strobe affecting day and night brighter in the day sometimes than at night. People with vision problems, seniors had trouble driving at night. We had left turn lanes at intersections that didn't move because people were watching the signs and not the road. It's a problem. This project never went to the Transportation Committee and it's a Transportation Communications Network. No one has ever looked at the traffic dangers. How is it that this program actually suggests to put 11 of the 16 non-freeway facing signs 
on identified streets in our city's high injury network. That boggles the mind. No one seems to care, except that I think Metro responded in their EIR that there would be no problem with the city DOT going in and putting in mitigations because the signs wouldn't disturb that should there be problems, which raises a huge issue. This city council has no mechanism in this program to address problems that arise, un unanticipated impacts, or any problems. It seeks to put signs where housing is meant to go. We are meant to be prioritizing housing constructions, and we know that much of that housing will go on commercially zoned land, and yet that's the very property that this program targets for its signs. How do you protect the tenants in those units from these signs? What happens when the buildings are built after the signs are in? And you can't do a thing about it. The refresh rates will be set, the signs will be in the ground, and they probably won't go away. I call your attention to the legal issues. At the very least, the city attorney's office should be asked to opine on whether or not this measure will undermine the city's ability to regulate off-site signage in the future. This industry, the outdoor advertising industry, has shown the city time and time again that it will take any opportunity to litigate to open up our visual environment to digital billboards, and this body should act to protect it. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, thank you. I'm Sam Puatasmanon. I'm here to speak on item 16. I support the River Park. The final EIR documents demonstrate the evolution of plans for Harbor West Lakes River Park and how the project has been modified and scaled back in certain ways to address some of the concerns expressed by community members, improve public uses, and lessen any potential impact on neighbors. In response to neighborhood concerns about noise, the pool canopy has been redesigned to be more efficient. The result continues to mean limited noise spillover and the canopy will now no longer be visible from the street. In addition, the diving boards have been eliminated from the pool as well. Additionally, as a result of the lower seating capacity, the amount of parking at River Park has also been reduced while still meeting city code requirements. The elimination of 129 parking spaces, bringing the total to 403, will mean that there will be substantially less grading and soil removal required to construct the subterranean parking structure. And in furtherance of additional support, uh, uh, sorry, additional accommodations, there were additional amendments that were read into the record this, today. Please join me in supporting Harvard West Lake School. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Amy Smith, and I'm here speaking on behalf of Creed LA in the support of the TCN project. Uh, what I want to call attention to and recognize is the fact that an otherwise stagnant space, ad space, could be utilized to find a missing child. We could be alerting of traffic incidences and avoid uh, avoidance methods, or even aid in the evacuation and safety of our public during an emergency event like the wildfires. If even one child is found safely because they saw an Amber Alert posted on one of these billboards, or a family safely evacuates from the San Fernando Valley because they know the proper evacuation routes that are posted during the emergency, that to me is priceless and invaluable, and that needs to be recognized and considered. We recognize the sentiment that many residents have towards this project, but we look at the hugely positive community benefits that will come and will stand strong to our economic, transformative, and communal benefits, uh, such as undertaking that Los Angeles deserves. We support this project, and we hope that you do too. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Hal Brody. I'm speaking uh, on number 16. I'm a resident of uh, Sherman Oaks. My wife and I have lived there for 35 years. Our daughter went to Harvard Westlake, excuse me, <clears throat> where she received an outstanding education, and I'm pleased to speak on behalf of the project. This is the third time I've had this opportunity, and it's no accident that every commission, committee, and board that has considered the issue thus far has given its approval, which this committee should do as well. 
our opponents, it seems to me, engage in a kind of collective magical thinking. In their view, this very valuable piece of private property must now and forever be operated as a money-losing tennis and golf facility, something that even Weddington's heirs didn't want to take on. Now, this committee knows that's simply not true. And this committee should know as well that if ultimately this project is denied, Harvard Westlake will sell the property. Thank you so very much. And uh, we'll sell the property, and the property will almost certainly be developed as a uh, multi unit. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, my name is Susanna Vittori and I'm here to support the uh, River Park project. Uh, my family and I uh, live very close to the Wellington Club and um, we totally appreciate that uh, our neighbors feel a strong emotion about uh, losing uh, a familiar place. And I've been there before, seeing a place wiped out, turn into a multi-story building and memories just gone overnight. The difference in this case is that the River Park is going to be a beautiful recreational place uh, and not the anonymous condo that it could have been. Um, also, I'm not sure how many knows, but um, Harvard Wesley will preserve uh, some iconic symbols of uh, Weddington, um, um, Weddington Club. The clubhouse, uh, the patting green in front of the clubhouse, uh, and uh, even the uh, golf uh, ball lights. So um, it will take some time to adapt, but ultimately, the community will still be able to have access and use in some ways uh, this, uh, this space. Therefore, I'd like to thank Harvard Westlake for acknowledging the community sentiment and for preserving some of the history. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My name is Carrie Sanford. The proposed project before you will benefit a select few, a few hundred students and their families but at what cost? Out of the community's requests, not many demonstrable concessions were made as part of a true compromise. Other similar schools like Brentwood, Archer, and Marlboro developed 20 or 30 year master plans and even worked with the community to develop private agreements that were more binding than requirements by the city. For example, enrollment caps and busing requirements were established at other schools. But none of that happened here. Instead, all we've received are vague promises with conditional language like open to the public when not in use by the school and if feasible or if possible. The community deserves better and would support the Angelinos for Trees alternative plan, which would preserve more natural green space and open space for community members. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, Lewis Sanford, item number 16. Is this uh, process tainted? Harvard Westlake promised to maintain the tranquility of our community, but did the opposite with this flawed plan. The Cultural Heritage Commission's recommendation protected the entire property in its current state was changed not once, but twice. A council member's letter of development restrictions mirrored the developer's own original plan. The same council member promised no changes to the HCM designation on a Friday and reversed himself three days later during the first plum. Two land commissioners who admitted ties to the developer refused to recuse themselves despite a clear conflict of interest and a strong public outrage. With deep pockets, government connections, and a huge ego, Harvard Westlake feels entitled to a CUP and will then destroy a 16-acre HCM, spend $150 million, and build a self-serving duplicative school sports complex, all at our expense. As I said, is this process tainted? Thank you, Speaker. Hi, I'm Jessica Graham. I'm a longtime Studio City resident and live near Weddington. My family loves Studio City. We fully support Harvard Westlake and fully support the River Park. Thank you, Councilmember Rahman and Council President Krikorian for your support. 
Thank you. And now we'll have Bart Reed. I will give him some time to approach the stand. Bart Reed. Hi, to expedite this, I'm uh, Bart Reed. I support the TCN project. It's an important project. There's people here that are putting out misinformation about it, but it's really important. It brings money into the city of Los Angeles, brings money into LA Metro, and it removes a lot of eyesore billboards. So I'd like you to please support the TCN project, and thank you very much, and I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Stuart Waldeman, Heidi McKay, Dale Fernandez, Lindsay Mulcahy, Sophia Leon. Please approach the left hand side. Good afternoon, Stuart Waldman representing VICA, Valley Industry and Commerce Association, over 400 business members here to speak on items 10, 16, and general comment. Uh, on item 16, we express our support for the Harvard-Westlake River Park project, which will provide athletic and recreational opportunities for students and the Studio City community. It's really for the kids. Harvard-Westlake is aware of the importance of preserving the Weddington Golf and Tennis site. Their development plans for the River Park campus revolve around principles and commitments to maintain the area as an open and green space. They have been actively engaged with the community and received feedback from various stakeholders which has played a pivotal role in shaping the project. And I have to say, in 1996, I became a field rep for Bob Hertzberg uh, when he was in the assembly, and, and I've seen every, um, every different variation of projects at Weddington. I got to meet the Weddingtons and see what was there. And this is really um, the least intrusive to the community of all the projects that I've seen. On item 10, we support LA Metro's transportation communication network and urge Plum Committee to approve the program the TCN that's offered by Metro promises to enhance the efficiency of our roadways, increasing public transit ridership, improving public safety, and generating revenue for transportation initiatives. It will significantly enhance the experience of bus riders by facilitating transit signal priority, providing bus Wi-Fi, and sharing bus timing information with passengers. Additionally, the TCN can assist in managing congestion data for important locations, especially during large-scale events. For these reasons, we ask this committee to support both items 10 and 16. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, my name is Dale Fernandez. I'm against item number 10 regarding the digital billboard program. The citizens of the city need more mindless screen time. <coughs> this is a quote no one will ever say. These digital signs create a blaze, uh, will create blazing visual blight with an increase in the light pollution of the city as well as the possibility of more distracted drivers. My next public comment is regarding item number 16. We truly just want a real park. The name of this project, River Park, is a misnomer. Harvard Westlake calls the river this project River Park, and just like their, name, their Harvard namesake, it's also just a contrived name. This project is not really a park, but a redundant set of sports facilities for a small private school. The River Park project is touted as giving community access to their sports facilities, but according to their FEIR, this sports complex is slated to be an event space for up to 2,000 attendees, 800 more than the 1,200-person Ford Amphitheater. 
the scale of this project is too large. I, I suggest that the Plum Committee consider it to be a privately owned public space, also known as a POPs property. Please refer to the Urban Design Studios database uh, for the examples of POPs property that truly benefit both private and public interests. A POPs designation can be accomplished by removing the Olympic sized pool and field B. Experts have com commented on this project creating heat islands, that's concrete hardscape and plastic fields. The remo removal of 240 mature trees from the already dwindling LA tree canopy will consequentially increase the ambient and surface temperatures of the local area. It will take to 2050 to, until the tree canopy will return from this area. The primary driveway access would have shared access with the fire station, possibly affecting response times and consequentially public safety. Please future proof this project by not allowing the use of artificial turf which will leach PFAS forever chemicals. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon, this is Lindsay Mulcahy with the LA Conservancy speaking on items number eight and 10. Uh, we support the HCM nomination for the complex for which we are the co-applicant. The complex is a rare remaining example of streetcar related commercial activity, but for its constituents today, it's more important as a site um, and an anchor of the Hollywood Theater Row as it's been for the last 40 years. We support the amendment to ensure flexibility of the building's future use and thank the property owner, advocates, CD13 and OHR for their collaboration. We encourage the owner to prioritize a the theater tenant so the building can continue to be a hub of performing arts in Hollywood. Uh, secondly, read the Metro TNC program. The Conservancy has concerns about the impact of digital billboards on historic neighborhoods and buildings. Uh, we would ask for consideration of guardrails um, to uh, mitigate adverse Im environmental impacts on historic resources and specifically ask that the proposed billboard at 4th and Hill, less than 300 feet from Angel's Flight, be removed from the program. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I will call a few more names. Elizabeth Hershala, James Min, Tracy Ayeni, Kalika Yap, Kim Tashman, Jordan Elise, Carrie Sanford. Should I start? <laughs> Please state your name and the items you're speaking on. Uh, yes, my name is Heidi McKay. I'm speaking on item 16. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for listening to the community and stopping the Bulgari Hotel, an obvious development that would have brought severe safety issues with no benefit to the entire neighborhood. River Park is also a development that has been objected to by the community. The fact that the Studio City Neighborhood Council the Residents Association and 11 other neighborhood councils have opposed River Park should be enough for this committee to not approve this as proposed. Harvard's earlier development in the canyon, according to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, would represent the worst environmental disaster in the last 30 years. The city fortunately saw the exaggerated claims of safety and benefit to all and did not approve that project. Harvard then moved to Weddington, which will have, sadly, an even worse, perhaps, impact. I trust this committee will choose to support the thousands of stakeholders, those who actually live in the community whose neighborhoods will be transformed forever, a community that will receive little benefit and yet bear the burden of an extreme negative impact brought to this neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to speak to item 10 and 16, please. My name is Kim Tashman. In relation to item 10, I'm against the billboards as I think they're a huge distraction. In relation to item 16, I um, have normally had something prepared and today I'm just gonna really speak from the heart. I find the whole situation very sad. We live in a city with very little green space. I believe we're supposed to have a thousand square feet per four people. We're very, very far behind in those statistics. And this is a beautiful site, the Weddington site, with magnificent trees that will not have the same canopy for 30 years, number one. Number two, there are many suspect aspects to how 
this project has moved forward. The historic nomination had key terms removed without findings, which is illegal, and a lawsuit was filed. That lawsuit is actually still pending, as are two other lawsuits relating to this project. It was my understanding this week from city officials that Harvard Westlake found that they may not be able to allow the general public who lives nearby use the facilities as a shared space due to insurance restrictions. I don't know what the facts are behind that, but that alone is a concern for all of the people that believe they will have access to this site. It is a precious site. It is a beautiful site. I am not anti-development. I am anti this project at this site. It is far too large for this bedroom community and would gladly support it being somewhere else and would work to see it be a success in another location. If you've not been to the site or if you're taking a look at the pictures there, at the overhead images that have been submitted, there was an image submitted of a before and after. This will not be a green space. It's the perimeter with grass and the interior is buildings, a stadium, a pool. It will no longer be a green space. And in Los Angeles, this is something that we still desperately need. And then finally, I'd like to just say, yes, it is purchased by Harvard Westlake, but we have zoning laws, and it's not zoned for this. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon, Council. My name is James Min. I'm here to speak in uh, favor of item number 16, and thank you for providing this forum. Uh, I want to publicly support the Verpa Park project. My father, who's 80, and several of his friends who are also seniors and live nearby uh, Weddington currently, have a lack of spaces to meet and socialize as many do not golf, nor do they play tennis. Uh, they like to walk for health benefits and do not feel safe currently at nearby public parks nearby. They have expressed the light that River Park will be open to the public for use and that it will be a secure site. Uh, the proposed project will expand the use and utility to a larger number of residents. I also want to address the erroneous and misleading statements about River Park only benefiting a, a few. Uh, so let's do some math. Uh, Studio City represents, represents about 0.09% of California's population. There are approximately 3 million golfers in California. That math results in 3,000 potential golfers who would use the driving range in the par three course there. Uh, that would be far less than the number of people that the proposed open space would benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hello. I support River Park based on the merits of the project. Continued recreational open space, community access to tennis courts, the pool, the track, and the walking trail. Please join me in supporting River Park. And what was your name? Elizabeth Herchala. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tracy Ayeni, and I'm here to speak in favor of item number 16. I support River Park. Um, for some of you who may be familiar with the online comment um, uh, regarding the project, many of them are extreme. Um, Harvard Westlake, as owners, current owners of the property, do not intend to do anything that drastically differs from what is currently there, except expand the number of sports that are available. Um, and it will still be recreational open space with community access. Um, this is a good and reasonable project and the community of Studio City will um, allow, um, have more of their residents to have access to this um, and enjoy the property. I hope that you'll join me in supporting the project. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the project. Thank you, Speaker. Nancy Abrams, Paul Moreno, Steve Hirsch, Wendy Rosen, Adam Wisblatt, Stephanie Granado. Please state your name in the item you're speaking on. Thank you. Council members Harris Lawson, Lee, sorry, Harris Dawson, Lee, Yaroslavsky, Padilla, Hutt, thank you all for your time today. My name is Jordan Ellis, and I'm here to speak on behalf of item number 16. Michelle Obama's Let's Move initiative sought to emphasize the importance of increased physical activity 
amongst children and their families. However, a lack of access to safe spaces for outdoor play has been cited as a primary barrier to physical activity for young children. That's why I wholeheartedly support Harvard Westlake and River Park. All the athletic facilities from the gym to the fields to the pool and the tennis courts will be available for the community's recreational enjoyment when not in use by the school. And Harvard Westlake has already partnered up with organizations such as Angel City Sports, Boys and Girls Club of Burbank and East San Fernando Valley, and the Special Olympics of Southern California. With River Park, let's move towards a healthier, more active future for our entire city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Abrams, and I'm speaking on item number 16. Um, I'm from the United States Tennis Association, Southern California. Um, on behalf of the governing body of tennis in Southern California, I'm here to express our enthusiastic support for the Harvard Westlake River Park proposal in Studio City. The River Park would provide new facilities for many sports, and we appreciate that the school is including tennis in its plans and providing access for tennis players throughout our community. The River Park's eight new top quality lighted tennis courts will be open to the public daily when not used by the school. And we're proud that the USTA Southern California has formed a partnership with the school to host instructional programs, adult and junior teams and tournaments, social and community events, and coaching development programs at the River Park. The dedicated USTA Southern California team is excited that the River Park will be accessible for the whole community to enjoy. I hope the city of Los Angeles will approve this wonderful project. And thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Steve Hirsch. Um, I'm a, a resident of Studio City, and I urge this committee to please um, reject the plan as submitted for the Harvard Westlake proposal. It is too large for the neighborhood. After years of meeting with Harvard Westlake and the community, the plan before you today is larger than it started and now encompasses the Zev Yaroslavsky Greenway. The great concern today is to consider the community benefits suggested by Harvard-Westlake. These benefits can come and go and will always be discretionary on the part of Harvard-Westlake. However, this project will forever represent a serious loss of open green space to the community. By reconsidering the project, Harvard-Westlake is in a unique position to make a real contribution to Los Angeles and Studio City. And the committee here, the Plum Committee today, is also in a unique position to make sure that that happens. I thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Wendy Rosen. I'm testifying on item number 10, the TCN program. Um, at the Metro board meeting following Mayor Bass's challenge to identify surplus land for housing, Council Member Krikorian said, that Metro must play a more active role in addressing homelessness because it directly impacts Metro's core mission. And he also said transit-oriented community development gives us an opportunity to create more affordable housing. Metro rose to the occasion and they put together a list of 17 Metro properties identified for housing. Four of those properties now have billboards slated for installation. The same lots planned for housing are now planned for billboards. So I ask Plum to please prioritize housing and remove those signs. They're NFF4, NFF5, NFF10, and NFF17. I just want to say that I really appreciate the amendments that were offered this morning, but there's still too many of these digital billboards, and they're in really, really impactful places where we need to do better as a city. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Paul Marino. I'm here on behalf of Ironworkers Local 433, expressing our support for item number 10. Uh, we are excited about this project because it'll provide good paying jobs and hire local residents who will both erect and maintain these signs. Uh, we are proud to support this project and strongly urge you to support it too. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I will call a few more names. Jessica Rivero. 
Teresa Leon, Sophia Pineda, Nick Gritchen, Mark Sokol, Kelly Porter, Armando Hurtado. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Sofía Pineda y vengo por el proyecto número 10. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sofía and I'm here to speak on item number 10. Hola. Este proyecto reducirá el deterioro de las vallas publicitarias al quitar las viejas y feas Hello. vallas publicitarias estáticas. This project will help the community by removing the old billboards and adding the, and taking away the old ones and ugly ones. That will give us some last generation billboards who will give us some important information like the early earthquake detention detection and Amber Alerts. Okay, muchas gracias. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Thank you, Speaker. I will call a few more names. Richard Granite, Jerry Hill, Mario Herreras, Arna Zlotnik, Derrit Frank. So Soy Teresa León y vivo en Los Ángeles. My name is Teresa León and I live in Los Angeles. Hago un llamado para apoyar a la red de comunicaciones. I am here to make a call so we can support the communication web. De transporte porque los ingresos podrían usarse para apoyar más proyectos. Of transportation because the money they will get could be used to support other projects. De tránsito como carriles para bicicletas, autobuses más seguros. Of transportation, like bicycle lanes and more secure buses. Y más sombras, por favor, apoye este proyecto. Gracias. And more shades. Please support this project. Thank you. Thank you, speaker. Hello, my name is Kelly Porter. I am speaking on item 16. I live on Laurel Grove Ave in Studio City, very near the golf course and have for 30 years. This matters because it is the residents of this neighborhood that will be the ones bearing the consequences of this oversized project for many years to come with little or no benefit. I speak on behalf of other neighbors unable to attend here today and ask you to please deny this conditional use permit. This development is injurious and detrimental to our community. It still does not practically or fairly benefit individuals in our community. It seems that to simply go running on the track or use any other facilities, an individual must provide a background check and liability insurance. How is that open or even equitable? Additionally, the neighborhood cannot absorb the excessive noise and traffic and parking levels of such a large development and all of their private partners, however noble. It is grossly incompatible with the character of the neighborhood. Please, please, please listen to the residents and deny this permit. Thank you, Speaker. I will call a few more names. Adam Schiff, Bari Labardi, Kobe Joe Perez, Ezra Fresh, Greg Gonzalez, Kirsten Albrecht, Martha Bazell, Terry Austin, Alexander Allen. Good afternoon. 
My name is Martha Bissell. My opposition to Harvard Westlake's private sports fortress is not about a private sale between two parties. This is about a conditional use permit that's not in the interests of the citizens of Studio City and Greater Los Angeles made by a board overseen by two Harvard Westlake alum, alumni. This project is deeply detrimental to our neighborhood environmentally, socially, and civically, and I implore you not to permit it to go ahead. This is not a park. Thank you, Speaker. The historical identity of golf and tennis facility cannot be understated. It's an integral part of the community and certainly one of the main reasons my wife and I bought the property diagonally opposite the third tee. Yes, I live about 20 yards away from the course. Our outside patio is a haven of tranquility. I strongly object to the majority of pro HW speakers blithely supporting a project when they live many miles from the site. We can already hear the competitive games at Harvard Westlake from our house. Why should we have to put up with the cheering and lights on our doorstep? When this project was first suggested, we attended a tea at our neighbor's house where the HW powers that be told my wife and I, fake to our face, the facility would be for practices only. No lights, no bleachers, no cheering. That now appears to be a bald-faced lie. Save the history, save the trees, save the wildlife. Community over privilege. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Barry LeBerry, and I'm a Harvard Westlake student here today for item 16 in favor of River Park. I'm proud to be a student at Harvard Westlake, and I'm grateful and fortunate to have received the opportunities they provided for me. One particular activity I'm especially grateful for is athletics. To be honest, I may not be the next Tom Brady or Usain Bolt, yet I'm fortunate to have had the opportunity to play football and run track where I've been able to stay healthy athletically and meet countless friends. And numerous other students, both at Harvard Westlake and at neighboring schools, have also been fortunate to play sports and do athletics. And with Harvard Westlake being open to nonprofit organizations like Angel City Sports, I'm positive that River Park will be a positive addition to a greater community as a whole. Thank you, and I hope you support River Park. Thank you, Speaker. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kirsten Albrecht. I'm here on item number 16. My children are 9th and 11th graders at Harvard Westlake and are both student athletes. We live in the Mid-City area in CD10 and my children are bus riders. The first stop on the route of this bus is at 6.10 a.m. at the Hawthorne Lenox Metro Station in Inglewood. And after a full day of classes, sports teams practice, the bus returns to Inglewood at 7.55 p.m. It's a long day for students. Um, they, they commute for three and a half hours a day. They get home, they eat, they shower, and they begin their homework. 65% of Harvard Westlake students are athletes. And 62% of Harvard Westlake students are students of color. The River Park Complex will not only benefit student athletes at, who happen to be on my children's bus route, but will serve, the community, serve as a community facility, benefiting all of the residents of Studio City. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm here to speak on item 10. Uh, this program will take down old eyesore billboards and replace them with a new system that provides critical messages and funds local transit projects like bike lanes. TCN is a no-brainer. That's all I have. Hello, everybody. My name is Ezra Freck, and I'm here to uh, show my support for the River Park Project. So I'm an above the knee amputee. I have two fingers on my left hand as well. And growing up, I fell in love with sports because it provided me with an escape from a lot of the insecurities surrounding my disability. Now, I was lucky as an amputee and getting a running blade at a young age to integrate into mainstream sports. 
I was able to play basketball, soccer, football, whatever was in season with my friends growing up, all throughout elementary, middle, and high school. I made the U.S. Paralympic team when I was 14 years old in track and field. I competed at the Tokyo Paralympics in 2020. This past summer, I just won my first world title and broke the world record in the high jump and, and uh, hope to continue to represent our city and our country in Paris in 2024 and then the Games in 2028. I'm here today to stress the importance of Angel City Sports and River Park to allow all sports opportunities for people with physical disabilities, especially those who don't have the ability to integrate those with more severe disabilities. So on behalf of all kids with physical disabilities, especially those unable to integrate into mainstream sports, I fully support the River Park project. Thank you, Speaker. Good afternoon. Thank you for the time. My name is Greg Gonzalez. I am the Director of Financial Aid at Harvard-Westlake and a member of the History Department. Over the last three decades, Harvard-Westlake has supported thousands of students through the Financial Aid Program. Many of these students come from low-income areas and from all over the city. This year, we enrolled 300 and 343 students who receive Financial Aid at Harvard-Westlake. Those students broadened the reach of our school. In a similar fashion, the River Park Project will broaden access and opportunity not only for our school, but for the community at large. Many examples you have seen here today. I urge the city to support the River Park Project. Thank you. Thank you. I will call a few more names. Bill Purcell, Farnosh Jabesh, Lori Young, Samuel Nieto, Joshua Pence. You may begin. Uh, yuppie nigger, happy birthday. But let me get into the business of the people here now. Uh, regarding uh, public access on item 16 and CD4, I find that fucking hilarious that such an access really exists because in other areas where there was public access, a white motherfucker like me couldn't go because of certain timelines. So you should really check yourself, nigger, before you wreck yourself. In addition to that, we have to understand that, again, uh, yuppie, these niggers are, are interrupting my public time, and can you hold my time? All right, bitch, I'll keep talking. That's what Padilla wants, I'll keep talking, bitch. Yeah, fuck you, bitch, I'll keep talking. And, and the you bitch gotta is be talking on, You back gotta be on topic, Mr. Too. Herman. Because again, I'm gonna speak on all items and non-agenda public comment, you yuppie nigger. So here's the fact. How far is the nigger going to? What is the nigger going to do? A dirty nigger send the Jews back to Israel. You're Why? Off topic. Why, because I plan to save America Put down those goddamn billboards. We don't want them in our community. Stick them in Beverly Hills. All right, Stick that's them it. in Israel. You're, you're off. You're off topic. That's your time. That's your time, Mr. Herman. Please stop disrupting the meeting. That is your time. You're dismissed. If you continue to talk, you will be removed. That's your second warning. Please remove Mr. Herman from the meeting as he continues to disrupt subject to rule 12 You're out. Please leave the meeting immediately. Mr. Herman, you're excused from the meeting. You've been asked to leave four times now. Please make your way to the door quietly.
Mr. Herman continued to disrupt at, as after he was asked to leave the meeting, he continues to disrupt from the hallway and from the rotunda. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm here uh, today to speak on today's agenda, item number 11 and 12. My name is Kobe Joe Perez. I'm a representative with the Western States Regional Council of Carpenters. I live in the local area and live and work and re recreate in the vicinity of this project. I believe that I will be impacted by the environmental impacts of the project. The city should require projects to be built with contractors with hire, that will hire locally, pay prevailing wage, and utilize apprentices from a state certified apprenticeship training program. Workforce requirements reduce construction related environmental impacts while benefiting the local economy and workforce development. In a recent 2020 reporting title, Putting California on the High Roads, a Jobs and Climate Action Plan for 2030, the California workforce development work included that investing in growing, diversifying, and upskilling California workforce can positively affect returns on climate mitigation efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Council Members, Marsha Hanscom, I'm with the Defend Biona Wetlands Coalition and Biona Institute. And I'd like to ask on number 10 that you remove FF30. It has the same impacts as you have on the Bowtie Project. Why would you not, why would you have these, these uh, big lit up billboards in a place where the nocturnal species will be harmed. Owls hunt at night. Their eyesight will be harmed. They won't be able to hunt. So please take those out. And then I'd also like to ask that you look at the letter from the Screen Actors Guild. I don't know if you've looked at it, but you know, this is, the filming is one of our biggest economic drivers in the city. And they're saying, they're gonna have more filming leave if these billboards, these lit up digital billboards are across our city. So I'm not sure why we're doing this, except a little bit of money, but then we're gonna lose money in the film industry. Please pay attention to that letter, thank you. I'm Marion Dodge, Chairman of the Hillside Federation, representing 250,000 constituents spanning the Santa Monica Mountains. I'm speaking on item number 10 and item number 16. Uh, number 10, TCN. This supplemental use district is, isn't either for transportation or for communication. It's for digital advertising. At least 24 neighborhood councils and 16 community environmental groups have opposed this blatant plan to enrich the sign industry at the expense of their safety. This clever program proposed by the sign industry is specifically designed to invalidate the 2002 ban on billboards outside the designated sign districts. The goal was to reduce visual blight and improve traffic safety. It will be impossible to achieve vision zero with flashing billboards drawing driver's attention away from the road. The Federation urges you to oppose this sign industry boondoggle. The sign industry waved a few dollar bills in front of your indicted former colleagues, Engladern and Huizar, and they fell for it. But you're smarter than that. Don't fall for that ploy. Um, Harvard Westlake River Park. Don't be fooled by the name of the project River Park. It is in reality a private sports complex for a wealthy private school. It used to be a golf and tennis facility enjoyed by the entire community. While everyone is promoting the need to plant more trees to fight climate change, this project would destroy 240 trees. This project is the opposite of equity. The Hillside Federation supports the appeals filed by Studio City Residents Association, Save LA River Open Space, and Save Weddington. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker.
Good afternoon. Thank you for uh, hearing us. Um, I'm DJ Frank. I'm with the Reseda Neighborhood Council, although I am speaking for myself on item number 15. Um, I would like to stress that this appeal that's up before the, the committee needs to be denied. The Reseda Neighborhood Council actually issued a statement um, to say that this should be denied because they recognize that this project is in a place called Reseda Ranch, which is a rural agricultural area with horse property, a lot of animal keeping rights. And unfortunately, when you plop a seven story apartment building down in the middle of a bunch of horse properties, all the horse property people are going to lose all their rights. And that's just been shown time and time again. Reseda Ranch is literally the only horse property area that's still affordable to working class people centrally located in uh, the San Fernando Valley. You either have to spend twice as much money in other communities or go way out onto the fringes. This is a very cynical ploy by a developer to put in a project that will break open the community and allow him to basically plunder the community and its larger lots. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Arna Zlotnick on behalf of the appellant as well as the neighbors of uh, project number 13 on the agenda. It has to do with uh, granting exception of a five foot setback in lieu of the 15 foot setback. We oppose that. There was a hearing uh, with the commission in July. They granted the, the exception. In violation Sir, are you the appellant or the applicant in for number 13? No, I, no. You're not either of those things? Correct. Got it, okay, sorry. But my friend is the appellant. Anyways, um, LAMC 11.5.7F1A, sir? Pardon sir? me? 11.5.7F1 says the commission has the authority to grant the exception except when it's a relief is granted from self-imposed hardships. And what this case has to do with self-imposed hardship, the owner developer knew of the problems and limitations at the time of purchase. The laws and the statutes are replete with the fact that if it's a self-imposed hardship, they aren't to be granted any relief. No one is above the law. Please, Thank you. Please be con cognizant that, that's of your that. Time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Hi, I'm Jerry Hill, stakeholder in Reseda Ranch. S opposed to item number 15, the apartment buildings in the Lolo. Uh, uh, RA1 zone horse property. This is not good for our uh, uh, community. It will be a, a blight and uh, 70 feet tall. The builder has 14 uh, itemized uh, variances on this um, building and um, this is not good. This is not, this is not what the residents of Reseda need. Um, please um, turn that down. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mario Herrera, and I'm here um, against the Reseda Ranch um, project. Um, I'm not a good speaker, so I'll say whatever I need to say. But uh, please, if you guys could say uh, save our Reseda Ranch. You know, this is. I can't believe that this is even happening in our neighborhood. Um, two apartment buildings going up in, in our Reseda Ranch. I mean, on the weekends, we see horses on our in our neighborhood, and it's beautiful. You know, I, I like to have my family over and just enjoy a, a ranch-style hangout. And this, one of the units, it's right on, on the side of my home. If this goes up, it takes away all my privacy and it's gonna bring so much chaos that um, my family and I, we're not, we're not ready for it. So I'm here to represent not only my family, but also the Reseda Ranch um, neighbors. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bill Purcell. 
I live a couple of blocks away from the Weddington Golf Course. Um, many people are disappointed that I'm not Bill Parcells when I show up. But um, recently I saw the headline, a new California law allows local governments to ban artificial grass amid environmental concerns, which is last week. So I sent an email to Nithya Raman, the council district four council member, and I, I couldn't quite get Karen Bass's email right, but uh, I said, please do the right thing and take action right away to prevent Harvard Westlake School's installation of synthetic grass on historic Weddington Golf and Tennis Club in Studio City. As Governor Newsom's recently signed bill demonstrates, and that's um, AB 15, 1572, the anti-synthetic grass bill, potable water, non-functional turf, it is critical to prevent the really dangerous carcinogens and forever chemicals, PFASs, as well as the plastic pollution and water runoff and extreme heat caused by this synthetic turf. Harvard Westlake's proposed large installation is harmful to the environment and not necessary. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Farnoosh Tabesh, and my family and I have lived in Studio City for the past 14 years, and we support Harvard Westlake School and River Park. Since 1950s, Weddington Golf and Tennis has been a for-profit business that has offered paying customers the ability to engage in two recreational activities, golf and tennis. Harvard Westlake understands that some stakeholders have come to value access to the recreational opportunities at this site. This historic use is accounted for in the plan for the Harvard Westlake River Park. And in fact, the River Park will not just preserve the community's historic access to recreational opportunities at this property, but expands upon it. River Park will offer far greater choice of recreational activities and will serve an even broader range of community stakeholders than the facility currently does. The planned athletic fields open to public for soccer, frisbee, playing a game of catch, uh, swimming pool available for public swim programs. The tennis courts open to public for matches and tournaments. Even the gymnasium open for reservation by community groups. The remodeled clubhouse, updated cafe, acres of beautifully landscaped park area. Thank you, speaker. Sorry. That's your time. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Samuel Nieto and I'm here in support of item number 10. I've always been a person that wants to know about the money and city finances. I read a post that said that revenue generated from this would be measly 300 to 500 million. Considering that we already have billboards up and they don't generate nearly that much in revenue, it really doesn't seem measly to me. I think this project will generate a lot of revenue for the city and will lead to new growth and development as well as much needed repairs and fixes. Let's support the local economy and the economic benefits this project will bring us. Thank you very much. Hello, City Council. My name is Joshua Pence, proud Angelino of 41 years and counting. Thank you very much for your time. I'm here speaking against Harvard Westlake's cleverly disguised River Park, which is in fact a private sports complex, period. With all due respect, it's likely been too long since any of us have attended math class, so let's review basic arithmetic. Today's lesson, addition and subtraction. Add a facility benefiting only 1,000 people per year with turf fields creating massive heat sinks, non-recyclable plastics which will spread into the river and surrounding habitat, yet another pool and track open only to the most exclusive high school in the city. Subtract a facility benefiting 100,000 people per year, a beautiful habitat for myriad species, 16 affordable tennis courts, an affordable driving range, a nine-hole course, 240 mature trees, 250,000 cubic yards of soil, and one massive open green space benefiting the entire local community. My Los Angeles public school education has taught me well. The basic arithmetic is clear and undeniable. I am not against Harvard-Westlake students. I am for the broader community's well-being. Thank you for your time. Your name and the item you wish to speak on. Hello, my name is Lori Young, and I'm speaking on item number 16. You have one minute. Um, I am against the proposed Harvard-Westlake project. I recommend that the alternative plan 
included in the appeal be approved, which involves removing field B and converting this area to open space. I believe this will allow some of the par part of the project to be preserved as open space as intended by the um, designated open space land use and agricultural zoning of the property. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we are going to have Stefan Samuel and Dave Rand for item 15, who is the applicant appellant. Please approach the stand. So if your name was called, go to that side. Adrian Corsani, City Attorney's Office. Question, um, Council Member, are we doing the appeals now? Yes. We're doing the appeals now? Yes. Okay. Do you want to call the item? What item are we considering, Councilman? Item number 15, we're hearing from the... So we're not hearing the item, we're hearing from the appellants for item 15? Yes. Okay. Correct. Because there's only one, the applicant and the appellant are the same person. Gotcha. gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Chairman, honorable committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Dave Rand with the law firm Rand, Pastor and Nelson here representing both the applicant of opposed 190-unit deed-restricted affordable housing project, as well as the appellant. Um, this is a project proposed, yes, on an RA zone lot. However, the project sits on a major arterial street with a general plan designation that allows multifamily use. And under the state density bonus law, very intentionally, the legislature has allowed relaxed development rights to achieve these sorts of 100% affordable housing projects. Today we are here today to appeal a determination made by the city planning department that the project is ineligible for ministerial processing under executive directive number one. This may sound familiar because we have been before you on a few occasions prior, including uh, a case in Sherman Oaks on Ethel Avenue, uh, where the very same fact pattern presented itself uh, as with this case, we filed an SB 330 preliminary vesting application that allowed the project under state law to proceed under the prior ED1 before it was changed to uh, uh, disallow uh, single-family zone multifamily projects to use ED1. The State Housing and Community Development Department has weighed in on multiple occasions. This committee recommended approval of the Ethel project and the council granted the appeal. This is the exact same issue, exact same case. HCD sent a letter to you dated October 12th, 2023, in which it said this Wilbur appeal is eligible for ED1 based on its vested rights uh, through the filing of the preliminary application. And that letter confirmed that there is no difference between this case and the Ethel case. They are essentially twins, not distant cousins, as the planning department staff report would have you believe. The planning department is going to uh, likely say that the case is incomplete because certain items have not been submitted within a statutory prescribed window. However, we submit that, that is an error because this case was terminated and automatically converted away from ED1 to a discretionary city planning commission case before the applicant had an opportunity to provide the required items, before the required statutory period was able to uh, able to, uh, uh, to, to proceed. So this, this case was prematurely cut off 
terminated, and this appeal is being filed to resurrect the ED1 case, redirect it away from this discretionary case back to ED1 where it belongs, where HCD has wrote you many times urging you uh, to pro how to process this case. So appreciate your time, and with that, I urge you to grant the appeal. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right, that, that uh, concludes public comment. Just I know there are lots of folks that did not get to speak. One more, item eight. Item eight, we will have the owner. Hold on, you, got, you can't disrupt the meeting. We'll have the owner, Alfred and Betty, approach the stand, please. For item number eight. Alfred and Betty for item owners for item number eight. Honorable committee members, Bill Delvac on behalf of the owner of 6464 Santa Monica Boulevard. We're pleased to be here today to support the council's action with the amendment uh, that was offered by the council office. This is a great example of the city's office of historic resources, the nominator and the owner working together with the council office, and we appreciate your interest. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now that concludes public comment for uh, this meeting. I know there's several folks that didn't get to speak. Just for the record, um, we spent over 90, in excess of 90 minutes in public comment, and we saw um, five, uh, nearly five dozen speakers. Um, so uh, that, concludes uh, what we're able to do this afternoon. Uh, hopefully uh, all points of view are reflected. Uh, we have on our consent calendar, uh, Mr. Mejia, items two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Items two through eight on our uh, consent calendar this afternoon. Very good, so um, to reiterate, items one and nine, those were continued. Yes. Um, the consent calendar item two um, this is a report from the city attorney and a draft ordinance to amend the municipal code relative to planning and land use fees and an annual inflation adjustment along with a city administrative officer report as to the fiscal impact of three new planning and land use fees the recommendation is to approve the city attorney prepared ordinance dated November the 2nd, 2023, and to note and file the City Administrative Officer Report dated September the 13th, 2023, inasmuch as it is submitted for informational purposes and no further action is required. Item three, this is a report from the City Administrative Officer and a report from City Planning seeking uh, author authority from the Council to retroactively apply for and accept a 2023-24 California Certified Local Government Grant in the amount of $40,000. The recommendation is to approve the City Administrative Officer recommendations in its report dated November the 1st, 2023, and thereby that the Council, uh, subject to the approval of the Mayor, authorize the Planning Department to retroactively apply for the grant um, in a total amount of $40,000, and um, two, to receive and file the August 3rd, 2023 Planning Department report, in as much as the recommendations in that report have been updated as reflected in the November 1st City Administrative Officer rec report recommendations. Item four. This is a zone change ordinance uh, located in CD6. Um, this is modifying the previously approved uh, square footage for a self-storage facility. The recommendation is to approve the zone change ordinance for the properties located at 14201 West Paxton Street and 10601 North Sharp Avenue as recommended in the Planning Commission report dated August 15, 2023. Item five, 
It's a sustainable communities environmental assessment. Uh, the project is located in CD 11. It's for a 210 residential unit building with 18 units for very low income households. The recommendation is to approve the SCIPI, the uh, Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment, as denoted in the Planning Department report dated September 25th, 2023. Item six, it's a report from the City Administrative Officer to authorize the Department of Building and Safety to execute a first amended and restated agreement to a contract with Core Business Technologies for continued maintenance and licensing services for the universal cashiering systems for the city's development services centers. The recommendation therein is to approve the city administrative officer recommendations uh, in its report dated August the 2nd, 2023. Item seven, this is a categorical exemption from CEQA and a cultural heritage commission report to include the uh, Piccadilly Apartments um, located in CD 10 as a historic cultural monument. Uh, the recommendation is to approve that inclusion as a historic cultural monument. Item eight, uh, this is another historic cultural nomination for the complex located in CD 13. The recommendation is to approve the inclusion of the property as a historic cultural monument. CD 13 has submitted um, additional language at the beginning of this meeting uh, that the nominations shall exclude interior, uh, a, an interior wall and partition walls in order to provide flexibility in reusing the building. Uh, that language uh, has been memorialized in a communication from CD 13 and uh, will be uploaded to the file. And those are all the consent items, sir. All right. So those items are before us. Uh, and I will call the roll on, on items uh, through two, sorry, two through eight. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. That's five members and unanimous, sir. All right. That takes us to item number 10. Item 10, sir, this is a previously certified environmental impact report and an addendum, the mitigation monitoring program. A report from the Planning Commission as to a proposed ordinance to stop for the establishment of a contiguous and non-contiguous supplemental use district, a signed district, and uh, denoted as or known as the Transportation Communication Network District. All right. Uh, it says we have a report from the Department of City Planning from Ms. Osborne. It looks like she's brought people. Hey, good afternoon, honorable council members. I'm Nuri Cho, senior city planner with the planning department. And I'm joined by the project manager, Terry Osborne, and our principal planner, Haku Solomon Carey. And the item before you is a council initiated code amendment and zone change to establish the Metro Transportation Communication Network, or TCN ordinance. Um, this ordinance would allow the installation of 46 digital display off-site sign structures with a total of 80 sign faces located on Metro-owned properties. The ordinance consists of two enabling ordinances amending both Chapter 1, the current zoning code, and Chapter 1A, the new zoning code of the municipal code, to establish the Metro TCN Supplemental Use District, also known as SUD. The ordinance also includes an implementation ordinance that contains the SUD provisions and associated zone changes. The ordinance that has been transmitted to the council file reflects the City Planning Commission's decision on October 26 to reduce the total number of sign structures from 49 to 46, impose a distancing limitation between freeway facing signs on the same side of the freeway, require the installation of public art on the back of single-sided sign structures and modify the takedown provisions to require the removal of existing static off-site signs to be located near the new freeway facing signs. In addition, CPC instructed planning to make recommendations to the city council to 
increase the number of signs that include both vertical and horizontal louvers relative to their location near sensitive receptors. As a result, planning's report transmitted to PLUM includes a recommendation to require 22 additional signs for a total of 24 signs to include both vertical and horizontal louvers due to their location within 500 feet of an, exist, um, an existing residential use and open space. Based on this information, staff recommends that the City Council adopt the proposed Metro TCN ordinances, including CPC's recommendations to require vertical louvers on 22 additional signs. Additionally, today, staff understands that council offices um, proposed amendments to the ordinance to remove signs FF4, NFF1, NFF7, and NFF20, in addition to the three signs that were removed by CPC. And amendments also included re reducing the distancing limitation between freeway facing signs from 1500, uh, I'm sorry, 2,640 feet to 1,500 feet allowing the takedown provisions relative to freeway facing signs based on a banking system and extend the sunset date of the ordinance to align with the termination or expiration date of the memorandum of agreement and increase the space limitation on scenic highways to um, 500 feet from 200 feet and lastly modify the hours of operation. Staff would like to respectfully request um, clarification on the hours of operation as um, there was a conflict in the proposed amendment. That concludes staff uh, presentation and both city planning staff as well as Metro are both available for questions. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that. If you all sit tight, we'll begin our uh, discussion of this item with our member of the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority, Council Member Yaroslavsky. Thank you so much, <laughs> Chair Harris Dawson. Um, is Metro here? Can they come up too, please? I'll just start talking while they're making their way up. Um, so thank you, Chair Harris Dawson. Um, colleagues, I'm gonna be honest and say that I'm uncomfortable with this vote. LA is already one of the most dangerous cities for vehicle-related deaths in America. Nearly 10 years ago, the city of LA set out on a course to bring traffic deaths to zero by 2025, uh, which is just over a year from now. Last year, though, 300 people were killed by motorists. So to put it kindly, we haven't made nearly enough progress. We haven't added desperately needed infrastructure improvements to reduce speeds and improve safety and yet we are being asked today to consider adding digital billboards to our streets and highways. Uh, and it's not just about safety. Many of the locations included in this report are located in communities directly adjacent to our freeways. These are communities that are already at a much greater risk for health-related issues due to poor air quality and are hotspots for neighborhood blight and other quality of life issues. If we're not intentional, these billboards have the potential to produce enormous amounts of light and impact the quality of life for residents across the city. All that being said, we know that the revenue generated from these billboards will directly benefit our streets and make them safer. So there is that to consider too. Safer intersections, safer sidewalks, more protected bike lanes. All the money would be funneled back into street improvements. And it would fill in a really important gap in our funding for street improvements. So I have a few questions for Metro given my concerns. Um, if we were to require vertical louvers, what proof do we have that they would be able to prevent light spillover? Um, so that's one question. Have you seen that these things actually work in limiting light to where they're supposed to go? Uh, and then how much expense is added to the addition of vertical louvers? And, and then the third question is, are they adjustable once installed? Thank you, uh, Councilmember Yaroslavsky. I'm Jack Rubens with the Shepherd Mullen Law Firm on behalf of the, Met the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority. And beside me is Holly Rockwell, the Senior Executive Officer of Real Estate for LA Metro. I think I'll take the shot at your first questions. Uh, you should know, sort of as a threshold matter, that the science and technology behind uh, digital science has advanced greatly over the past few years in terms of really being able to shield spillover effects on adjacent areas. And that was extensively studied in the environmental impact report for the project. 
and it was determined that the project and those signs would not have any significant lighting impact on any adjacent resource, in particular on environmentally sensitive areas. And for the four sites that were deemed to be environmentally sensitive, only two actually remain now, excuse me, there are actually five to begin with, actually two only remain now since the City Planning Commission uh, eliminated FF13 and FF14. But for those remaining two signs that are near environmentally sensitive areas, um, there is a requirement in the ordinance, which is also a project design feature in the environmental impact report that limits the spillover to a 0 0.02 foot candle. That is actually four times more restrictive than the normal standard that's applied in California, which basically means there will be no light trespass and no spillover onto those adjacent areas. Um, the technology does work and the EIR demonstrates fairly clearly that it will be very effective here. What about um, the added expense of adding vertical louvers? Go ahead. Yeah, if I could add one other thing, Council Member. Um, these, the benefit, one of the major benefits of this program is that Metro will own the signboards. So to your question about being adjustable, um, these will be publicly owned. Um, and so before, the existing signboards are all privately owned. We don't have control over the lighting or any other aspect of it. But if we do identify an issue, then we will have, we Metro will have the ability to, um, to fix that issue, and we will do so absolutely. And then as far as your question, are the, I think you asked if the louvers are adjustable? Adjustable in cost. They are not adjustable. They're prefabricated based on the specs that are provided. So once they're in, they're in. Uh, and it is a bit more expensive to add, uh, to, add to include louvers, whether they're horizontal or uh, vertical. But that's not really the issue. The issue um, in terms of adding the vertical louvers that you've suggested is that the unintended consequence of that would be to not allow the signs to be seen for the intended audience, which are the people driving on the freeway or the roads. Um, you wouldn't prevent lights, you, you wouldn't prevent light spill over to sensitive areas, but you would prevent the people who are intended to see the signs from seeing them. Understood. Uh, have you conducted studies on traffic safety related to the program? The environmental impact report includes an extensive analysis of the uh, uh, potential correlation of digital signs to increases in traffic collisions. And as both the draft EIR and final EIR demonstrated with really significant uh, analysis, is that the Federal Highway Administration has determined that there is no correlation between digital signs and any increase in traffic collisions. Caltrans has concurred in that determination and there is no study that we're aware of that exists that demonstrates that there is any such correlation. Opponents of the project have suggested that there are, but when you actually read the reports and you analyze them and you discuss them in an environmental impact report, the clear conclusion is there is simply no correlation, no proven correlation. Just a couple more questions. Um, it's my understanding that some of the proposed sites for these signs are on sites that are also slated for housing. Um, how would the TCN structure impact Metro's ability to provide housing? Uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, I have the privilege of um, overseeing Metro's affordable housing program, our joint development 10K program. Um, and we will, um, we will never allow a sign board to be in conflict with an affordable housing project. We have already um, gone through the sites and determined ones that are in conflict and removed those. I don't believe the remaining sites will be in conflict, but again, if there was ever a conflict, we would choose our housing program over the revenue source and would remove the sign accordingly. Okay. A um, couple more questions for Metro. How have digital advertising rates fluctuated over the last 20 years, and how can we be confident that revenue projects, uh, projections are going to hold? Um, as I think the main benefit is, is clearly the revenue. So yeah. what sort um, of modeling the, um, have you done? Yeah, currently, uh, Los Angeles is a major city, is under capacity for digital advertising, so there is a tremendous demand for it. Um, our existing signboards, their static signboards, uh, generate almost no revenue at all, and so this will be a tremendous increase in the revenue. Um, and this is an area that continues to increase um, um, all the time in terms of the uh, amount of money that can be generated. Um, if we don't own the billboards that are up right now that we're proposing to take down, 
at the ratios that we're proposing to take them down, how are we gonna guarantee that they're actually gonna come down? What's, how is that possible? So we will, uh, re we will reach agreements with the existing advertising companies for the space that they can have on the new digital billboards. It will be a condition of them having space in the new digital billboards to take down the existing static sign boards. And we seem to think that they're going to be willing to take down their existing billboards in exchange for space on the new digital ones? There is a very big appetite for digital signage over static billboards from the advertising companies. Okay, and do you see people um, a sort of, we just adopted this stat program, right? So, and there's this sense that there might be a glut of advertising opportunities where we're poaching from STAP to and people are going to move over to TCN. You're saying that that's probably not going to happen because there's not enough advertising space to begin with? That's correct. Okay, I just have a couple questions for planning. Um, is NFF7 within 200 feet of a scenic highway and, and is that allowed under current regulations? Yes, Nuri, with uh, city planning, yes, that is within 200 feet of a scenic highway, um, specifically Venice Boulevard. Is that allowed under the current regulations around scenic highways? Right, based on the current regulations in the ordinance, it wouldn't be allowed. So as part of the approval process, we'll take a look at the exact distancing between um, the freeway as well as the, the non-freeway facing sign, and um, we, uh, we wouldn't be able to recommend approval for that sign. Okay, I think we're gonna, pr we've proposed taking that out entirely. Um, so the, the draft ordinance requires a five-year plan approval and update process. What are the goals of the plan approval and update and what data can we expect to be able to have as part of that review? Right, so that provision was actually suggested by LADOT after reviewing the Metro TCM program. And the purpose is really to give Metro an opportunity to consist consistently collect data on collision around um, Metro TCN signs. And that would be based on an annual um, basis. And the goal is to really look at the collision data and see if there is an opportunity or if there is a need to modify any of the operational standards in the ordinance, including, you know, refresh rate, uh, yes, refresh rates and hours of operation. If what I might the, um, May Sorry. I just add one thing, yeah. Hagu Solomon Carey, for the record. I think it also provides a very unique opportunity to get localized data to, in some sense, once and for all settle how digital billboards impact um, traffic safety, particularly as it relates to rear ends. And so all of that analysis could be provided by Metro and analyzed by DOT and come before a hearing in order to see if any you know, operational standards, as my counterpart said, would be necessary. Okay, thank you. Um, so what are the enforcement mechanisms if we find that the display refresh rate is increased beyond eight seconds or other requirements aren't complied with? Is that built into the contract? Yes, Nuri Cho for the record. So Metro TCN signs would be subject to the same existing enforcement mechanisms for all other signs as well. So in the event there is a non-compliance issue, DBS would um, provide inspection and um, be able to issue an order to comply. We have faith that they have the capacity to do that. I guess that's a whole other question. Yeah, I think we'd reserve that question for the department. Um, but you know, I think there's been review of the ordinance by that department, and um, we would hope so. Just one more question: um, Why is the takedown process different for freeway facing and non-freeway facing signs? And and what assurances do you all have um, that you're going to be able? I mean, have you sort of answered it, but. This is really important, and it's one of the only ways I can get myself to support this, is, is that the takedown ratio is, is much more significant than what's coming on. And so that's part of why I proposed um, staggering the removal so that it's not all at the back end, but it's happening. Because I, I, the proof of concept is important here. So, so why the difference between freeway facing and non-freeway facing, I guess, is my first question. Sure, Hagu Salman Kerry for the record. I think we share your, um, your sentiment that the takedowns are one of the main benefits of the program to the city. Um, the difference between the freeway facing and non-freeway facing was a bit of a negotiation between Metro and the department. Um, they have provided a higher level of detail for freeway facing signs. I think their 
preference is to get those signs up first um, for revenue um, purposes, but obviously they can clarify. Um, our goal, and as it was stipulated in the MOA, is that 200 signs would be taken down within the city limits. And I think given the level of specificity on the sign plans and the elevations and what they might look like, we have some assurance that, you know, they can be done, done in a manner that we've been able to review and requesting that 200 sign takedown in advance of, at least that was our recommendation to City Planning Commission, in advance of the first sign being erected was really our goal to get that bulk takedown. That was modified in CPC's recommendations to be um, the 125 that Metro um, currently owns, which would I think facilitate a faster removal, whereas the non-freeway facing ones, you know, may not necessarily um, necessitate as much of a bulk takedown before and can default to the standard um, square footage ratio relationship. Thank you. I just have one more question. Is Metro going to be allowed to count unpermitted signs toward the required takedowns? The retro for the record. So currently the ordinance allows the first 125 freeway facing signs to not have a valid building permit and that was a, um, a decision by the city planning commission. For all other signs, the ordinance does require a valid bu building permit to be provided. So we're not following our own rules, but we're gonna let Metro take down ones that we're not taking down as part of this deal. I mean, we should just be taking down ones that aren't permitted and then it should be additive but that's all right um colleagues earlier i submitted amendments to this report uh, which i think will help ameliorate some of my concerns outlined today um, my amendments would remove several locations being considered for sign placement they'd require vertical louvers for specified locations to limit ambient light intrusion set operating hours and prioritize billboard removal in neighborhoods adjacent to the new digital signage um, and so I would ask for your support of these amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Yersofsky. Mr. Lee. Just out of curiosity, I know that we uh, I know the time has moved from 24 hours and that it was shortened, uh, I think, from, I believe, 5 to 1 o'clock, if I'm not correct, and then it was shortened to 5 to 12. Do, do we have... You know, I understand why Ms. Yaroslavsky, I know her concern for her commun our communities and the light pollution that these might cause. Do we have any reports that show the differences in what we would be receiving as far as revenue? Do we have anything? Has any, is there anything that's been provided? I just got these amendments and I just don't, you know, I'm trying to understand how it's going to affect us and our ability. I understand, I see the 50 removal. I, I just don't understand what the, you know, I'd like the time to understand what these different things mean to us, but there's nothing, if, if there's no report, there's nothing, this is not, I mean, do you have something like that that shows the difference in revenue and how that is all affected from Mr. Oslovsky's amendment or from the others? Thank you, council member. Um, we don't necessarily have any reports on the particular revenues. Um, our driving interest in the hours of the signs is for the eight seconds that we have of each almost minute um, that we get to do transportation messaging. Our commuters are there from 5 a.m. until midnight easily, and so we want to be able to reach those commuters at 5 a.m. to let them know the best way to get to work um, that particular day. So that's our, our, our major driving consideration behind the hours that we're requesting. So there was a reason for the 5 to 12. That's the start time and end time of the different of the... Yeah, I believe there was, it was 5 a.m. to 2 a.m. We'd be content with 5 a.m. to midnight in terms of reaching our transportation commuters. Okay, well... Uh, Mr. Chersofsky, I understand your concern, and I understand, uh, you know, I, but I just received this amendment. I, I mean, I'd like the opportunity. I'd love to be able to see the report and try to understand this a little bit better. Uh, this was just handed to me, so um, I feel a little uncomfortable of voting on an amendment that I don't uh, understand right now. Uh, I would love to be able to have that time to kind of really kind of understand this a little bit better. So. Is there a possible way, uh, Mr. Arslati, is there a possible way to? Yeah, I have a proposal, um, and I've, we've talked to the council president's office about this. I, I think it's really for the non-freeway facing signs that I have the most concerns about the operating hours, and so I would propose that the operating hours that I proposed amended to be from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. 
uh, apply to non-freeway facing signs, which means that the freeway facing signs would be sort of set by Council President Krikorian's proposal, which is a, a longer five, five, a little before 5 a.m. to midnight or something. And how many signs is, are affected? Or who, how many are the non-facing signs out of this? We've run this by Metro and planning. What's, what are, what's how many the are the non-freeway facing? It, it was 16 structures originally and 25 signs, I believe. That's been reduced by the City Planning Commission, though, a little. No, it hasn't. They only reduced freeway-facing signs, so it is still 16 structures and I believe 25 signs. So there's 25 signs, but 16 are non-freeway-facing? No, there are 16 structures. Some of them are one-sided with signs. Some of them are two-sided. So there's 16 structures and and 25 signs, either on one or both sides of those 16 structures. Okay. Nuritro, for the record, so there's a total of 46 signs. 30 of them are freeway-facing signs, so they would be subject to um, the hours of operation of 5 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, I'm sorry, 5 a.m. to 12 a.m., and there are 16 non-freeway-facing signs that would be limited to um, council member Yaros, uh, Yaroslavsky's um, amendment. And that is a reduction in what revenue? Yeah, I, I don't have those, I don't have that type of information. Um, even with the non-freeway facing signs, we feel that communication on the transportation is important for getting people off of major arterials as well. So again, our focus is more on the communication with the commuters than it is, even for non-freeway facing than the revenue. And is this item then going on to, uh, straight to council? Is this item going straight to council after this, after the I was, I thought it was going to go to T, but okay. I don't know where it's is going. Is it going to transportation? It's not going to T. Huh? It, it, Mr. Chair, I do have a question. Could, could we ask for a report back so that we have more information? Because I just got the amendments as well. I mean, just. So I, I think what, uh, if I'm hearing this out right, we love this information uh, when it comes to transportation committee. I believe that is where is that it is not being sent there. It, so where's it's, the next place? It's, if you proceed to request the city attorney to prepare the ordinance, the city attorney will bring that ordinance back here. So, so it'll come back to committee, and and uh, yes. can. W so, my suggestion would be that we, when this comes back to committee, that we have this information about revenue. And an understanding of the replacement schedule. I, yes, I'm assuming uh, Mr. Charles is making it so that it's going to be more beneficial that we're going to be moving more signs on a quicker, more quickly, yes. yeah, uh, more quickly, uh, at a faster pace. Uh, if it, it, it ties the removal to the construction, so rather than getting a big tranche up front and then nothing until the very last TCN goes in. The idea is that as you, as you put in TCN signs, you're taking out non-digital billboards because otherwise, there's I have the concern that they, you just never put in the last one, which trigger it's the last one going in that triggers the last big tranche of non-digitals coming out. So you sort of have it all going at the same time rather than waiting till the very end. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I yeah, I'm trying to understand. I understand what you're. In, we need a whiteboard. Exa example, yeah. <laughs> I need a graph and an easel. No, I understand what you're saying. They could just not put the last one in, and it would never ever right. trigger, uh, the, trigger, removal trigger of the removal those, of, yeah. the, of the rest. So I, 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 I get that. And uh, I just, does that affect anything as far as revenue, uh, the removal of signs, the, the pace you, that we're Member. doing? We, we've actually submitted a letter that I believe is consistent with the final bullet point that. Uh, 50, for, with, with respect to freeway facing signs, which yeah. we understand the last bullet point is about, that 50 uh, signs would be removed before the first building permit is issued for a new freeway facing sign, and then at least four signs would thereafter be uh, removed to get each subsequent building permit 
for a freeway facing sign. So by the time you get to the last freeway facing sign, the full 200 signs have been removed. So I, I think what we've proposed it seems to be similar with that last bullet point, if we're reading it correctly. I mean, I would really like to see the revenues and try to figure out exactly what this would mean uh, to us as a city. So, unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to not support the amendment. All right. I'd so, like to. <laughs> so, uh, so we've got a handful of amendments from this Yaroslavsky, one of which Mr. Lee uh, opposes. Um, so, if there's no further discussion, uh, Mr. Mejia. Oh, I have one more. Yes, I'm sorry. Ms. Yaroslav. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'd like to strike, uh, the, I've been advised by uh, the city attorney's office to strike the proposed amendment extending the distance from the scenic highways from 200 to 500 feet. So that piece of the amendment should be stricken. 200. Increase the spacing, you're striking. All right, referee Mejia, what do we have before us? So what's before you, um, presumably if you wanted to proceed this way, is to request the city attorney to prepare the ordinance to prepare, um, for the supplemental use district as recommended by the city planning commission with all of the amendments that have been submitted at today's meeting. So the amendments were from Council District 1, 5, 2, and 13. Um, All right, but we have one amendment that Mr. Lee wants to Is there to any go. way to separate No, the, can we, we need to separate out the one that... Can we separate just the, the operational time? Because uh, I think I'm comfortable with all the rest, but yeah. we can separate so, the operational time. The operational time um, for the non-freeway facing signs from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. is included in Ms. Yaroslavsky's letter. Correct. Right, so can we take that, can we separate that provision? Can we bifurcate like just yeah. that item out yeah. as a separate amendment? Okay, so you want- I'm with everything else. So you don't, you are, you wanna remove that? We wanna vote on it separately. Correct. Okay. We wanna want to remove it, so let's vote on the totality of the, the motion and the totality of the uh, amendment save the one regarding operation time. Very and then good. We will vote separately on the one for operation time. In fact, to make it easier, what we will do is we'll vote on the operation time first. Okay. And then we'll vote on the rest. So uh, the one as to the operational times included in Ms. Jaroslawski's letter is to limit the hours again of operation uh, to be from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m in non-freeway facing signs. Um, so I will call the row. Mr. Um, Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. No. Okay. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. No. Ms. Hutt. No. So uh, th those are three no's and two yes. Uh, that does not carry. All right, so we'll vote on the Motion with the remaining amendments. Yes, so the, the other um, motion is to request, as I have stated, the city attorney to prepare the ordinance for the supplemental use district as recommended by the city planning commission with the amendments submitted at today's meeting by CD1, CD2, CD5, CD13, and we have removed with the prior vote the limit on the hours of operations. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Yes. Ms. Jaroslawski. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. That's five eyes, and that uh, recommendation carries. Now, uh, council member, these recommendations uh, as to your preference will be referred to the city council, is that my understanding? Or will you wait till the city attorney prepares the ordinance and hold the item in committee? Yeah, we need to hold, we need this item to come back to committee. We'll hold it in committee. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you all.
That takes us to item number 11 and 12. We'll hear together, although we'll vote separately. Yes, um, item 11 and 12. Item 11, uh, Mr. Chair, is a report from the Planning Commission. Um, this is for the construction of a mixed-use building with 151 dwelling units, 17 units set aside for very low-income households, and it includes an appeal by the Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility, SAFER, challenging the approval of the conditional use permit and the site plan review. Item 12, which is in a related same project, is the environmental clearance, the sustainable communities project exemption. All right, we'll hear from Department of City Planning. Good afternoon, honorable council members. My name is Stephanie Escobar with Planning. Um, I will be presenting the next two items, 11 and 12, for Council Files 23-0673 and 23-0673-S1. The subject project is a new seven-story mixed-use residential building in Hollywood consisting of 151 residential units, including 17 units set aside for very low-income households. This project was fully approved by the City Planning Commission on May 11, 2023. Before us now is an appeal of the conditional use and site plan review components of the project. The appellant is the Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility, also known as SAFER, whose arguments are primarily regarding air quality and noise health and, uh, risks. These types of comments had already been addressed by the applicant and planning staff at the City Planning Commission, where, this, where the City Planning Commission found that the comments presented were based on insufficient evidence, therefore the project was approved by the City Planning Commission. Subsequent to that, SAFER appealed the project alleging the same kind of arguments which planning staff has addressed in an appeal report for PLEMS review and submitted to the council files. The Class 32 exemption prepared by the applicant for the project properly analyzes and accounts for the project's potential impacts. With that, regarding uh, addressing item 12, is for a Sustainable Communities Project exemption, or SCIPI, prepared by the applicant and reviewed by planning staff for compliance for the same project. In addition to the Class 32 categorical exemption approved by CPC, the applicant also prepared a SCIPI, which planning staff reviewed for compliance. With that, CD13 is generally supportive of the project and would like to see housing in, a place, in place of a vacant commercial use currently on the site, which has attracted criminal activity in the past. Therefore, planning staff recommends that Plum deny the appeal for item 11 and approve the Skippy for item 12. We're available for questions. Thank you so much for your time. All right, uh, with that, we'll ask the appellant to in three minutes or less make their case to the committee. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, good afternoon, honorable members of the Plum Committee. My name is Marjana Bubo of Los Ojuri, and I'm here on behalf of SAFER, the Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility, and its members who live, work, and recreate in and around the city of LA. SAFER appeals a project located at uh, 1200 Vine Street and asks the Plum Committee to approve our appeal and deny the project. This project was originally reviewed under the Class 32 categorical exemption, but is now also being reviewed under a Skippy. Regardless of whether we were notified of these developments, neither exemption should apply here, and SAFER has submitted substantial evidence addressing concerns related to air quality and noise. As SAFER has explained in our submitted comments, the project cannot apply, qualify for a Class 32 exemption if the project results in significant noise and air quality impacts. SAFER criticizes the project's failure to provide adequate inputs or prepare a health risk assessment, despite the city relying on clearly unreliable and sometimes obsolete information. For example, the city's noise analysis rests on the implementation of barriers to reduce noise levels emitted from construction equipment, However, this is based on the flawed assumption that such barriers will completely enclose the construction equipment being used. As such, the city uh, has not provided substantial evidence to conclude that the project will have less than significant noise impacts. In addition, pursuant to CEQA, a project cannot qualify for a skippy 
if the site is subject to a risk of public health exposure at a level that would exceed state agency standards. In the Skippy, the city's consultant maintains that such public health exposure would not exceed the state standards. However, their analysis fails to address the formaldehyde or diesel exhaust concerns that were raised in SAFER's prior comments. As an independent expert consultant explains, future residential occupants and commercial employees would be exposed to a cancer risk that exceed the South Coast Air Quality Management District's CEQA significance thresholds for airborne cancer risk. Unfortunately, the city skip City Skippy document does not provide any response or rebuttal to the substantial evidence put forth by SAFER. For these reasons, SAFER respectfully requests the city to uh, approve our appeal and deny the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we'll hear from the applicant. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Committee members Dave Rand, Rand Pastor, and Nelson. Very briefly, this is a quality housing project. Council members, more affordable housing than you're used to seeing with your typical TOC project. No community opposition, unanimous support of the local neighborhood council. Substantial evidence in the record supports the planning department's conclusions. There are no air quality, noise, formaldehyde uh, related impacts. Um, experts have weighed in and rebutted each of SAFER's objections in this regard. And with that, we urge you to uphold the categorical exemption, deny the appeal, and grant the Skippy exemption. Thank you. All right. Um, do we have testimony from Council District 13 in the person of Ms. Howard? Good afternoon, Council Members. Emma Howard, Director of Community Development and Planning for Council District 13. On items 11 and 12, our office recommends that you sustain the determination of the City Planning Commission and staff. Thank you. All right, uh, so there, uh, Mr. Mejia, is a motion to deny this appeal. Yes. If you could read the specific instructions into the record and yes. call the roll. Yes, sir. Uh, so for item 11, sir, the recommendation is to deny the appeal filed by Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility, SAFER, and thereby sustain the Planning Commission recommendation to approve the condition of use permit and the site plan review for the construction of the mixed use building with 151 dwelling units, 17 units set aside for very low income households. The project is located in CD 13. In item 12, which is interrelated, it's the environmental clearance. It's to approve the environmental clearance, the sustainable communities, project exemptions, and the findings contained in the planning department report dated September the 19th, 2023 in as much as the project uh, is a transit priority project and thereby exempt from CEQA. I will call the road. Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslav. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yeah. That's five uh, eyes and those actions carry, sir. All right, what's next? Uh, next would be item 13 which is a categorical exemption from CEQA. The related findings are a report from the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission in an appeal filed by Rudy Artanto challenging the approval of specific plan exception uh, for this new construction of a three-story single family, of a new three-story single family dwellings along with the um, parking spaces. Uh, the project is located in CD 11. All right, we have a report uh, from Department of City Planning. Hello, uh, council members. I'm Michelle Singh with Planning Department. Item 13 is an appeal of a specific plan exception for a residential development. The project was approved by the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission on August 17th, 2023, and was subsequently appealed by an aggrieved party. The Area Planning Commission approved a specific plan exception to allow reduced front yards of five feet in lieu of 15 feet otherwise required by the Exposition Corridor neighborhood uh, Transit Neighborhood Plan, as well as a Class 32 categorical exemption under the California Environmental Quality Act. Staff transmitted to the council yes. file a letter to Plum dated November 1st with responses to the appeal points raised. The appellant has not demonstrated that the city has erred or abused in its discretion in approving the specific plan exception. Uh, therefore, we are recommending that Plum and City Council deny the appeal and sustain the West LA Area Planning Commission's action in approving the project. Thank you. 
All right, now we'll hear from our appellate. Good uh, evening, your, uh, council person. You got to speak into the mic. Arna so Slotnick for Mr. Uh, Hurtado. In this matter, uh, this, this representative of the city indicates that there was no abuse of discretion. Well, that's our position that it was, in fact, an abuse of discretion. According to the LAMC 11.5.7 F1A, they have the authority for granting exception except they shall not use uh, it to grant a special privilege nor to grant relief from self-imposed hardship. Council person Harris Dawson, this case has nothing to, but the, the support of a self-imposed hardship. When the owner bought the property, he knew of the limitations. He's requesting a five-foot setback exception from the 15-foot setback requirement. And it's, it's incumbent upon, upon this August body to recognize the fact that it's a self-imposed hardship, and that's it. No one's above the law. You can't deny that fact. The requirement of the, of the council requires you to make a finding of fact showing why, why this specific plan fails to comply with the requirements. I, I don't see how you cannot find that this was not a self-imposed hardship. And if that's the case, then the commission, when they granted the exception, abused their discretion to do so. Additionally, there was an issue of trees. Um, in the right of way, there's uh, trees that they're saying, at the hearing, the representative for the owner indicated there will not be uh, chopping them down. In the determination letter, they indicated that the trees would have to be uh, torn down. And I'd like to know why the recommendation and a representation by the owner at the hearing, the commission hearing in July, is not um, binding on the, on the uh, dis determination by the, uh, the commission in this matter. They indicated that there would be no trees felled, and now they're saying that they do. So the council persons, I would be um, asked that you recognize the fact that there is a self imposed hardship. It's replete in the statutes that you could not grant relief when that's the case. No one is above the law and you cannot deny the fact that that exists here. So when they indicate that there was no abuse of discretion, that's misleading this, uh, this council. And, and I would ask that you actually look at the law and look at the facts of the case. <laughs> And we, we request that you deny their application and uh, allow us to uh, live in peace in our neighborhood without this four house, three story house unit, uh, units be built on a, a previously one house unit uh, property. It's Thanks so much. That's your time. Now we'll hear from the applicant in this case. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, uh, esteemed Plum Committee members. My name is Jesse Harris. I'm from Brian Silveran Associates and uh, we're representing the applicant. Um, as stated, the proposed project is a four unit small lot subdivision that's really all about making creative use of a very irregular site. And, and just to give you an idea of how irregular this site is, uh, currently on the site is a 1400 square foot single family home that's built over the property line and into the public right of way. So the small single family home that's already there can't even fit within the boundary of the existing lot, uh, let alone observe the required setback. Um, in fact, on, on one side, the, the current single family home that's there is built 10 feet over the property line uh, into the right of way, and on the other side, it is only three feet from the property line. So actually, um, the proposed project would increase the, um, the yard setbacks from what they currently are. Uh, and this, this isn't just a tricky site for uh, four small lot homes, which is what's proposed, but it's a tricky site even for the single family home. Um, so we're seeking relief so that we can provide the most reasonable projects available to us. Um, the, the lot on which the project is sited is zoned R3EC. Um, a typical R3EC zoned lot in the area 
is rectangularly shaped um, and has either 25 foot or 50 foot front frontage. A lot of the lots are double lots uh, and a depth of 110 feet. So typically a 15 foot front yard in the, uh, on, a, on a typical lot in this area only reduces the total lot area by about 13 and a half percent. The subject property has a very narrow and irregular uh, shape. It's wedge shaped and it has two front yards. Um, so the lot area of the, of the subject site, which is about 7,400 square feet, is reduced by 72.3% if um, the yards of the specific plan are strictly applied. We met with the neighbors uh, and the West LA Sawtell Neighborhood Council Plum Committee several times to discuss the project. We did, uh, the Neighborhood Council Board voted in support of the project. Um, I, I do wanna say I understand the desire of the neighbors to hold on to the single fa family character of this neighborhood. But this site is less than 1,000 feet from the Expo Line Bundy Station and a few years ago, this neighborhood was rezoned to R3 multifamily specifically for the purpose of providing more infill housing along the Expo Corridor. Uh, with this project, we are helping to meet that goal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anything from Council District 11? Mr. Cowell? I think it's too close to 5 o'clock. All right. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mejia, we have a motion before us to deny this uh, appeal. Appeal? You can read the specific instructions to the record and call the roll. Uh, yes, sir. So it's to deny the appeal filed by Rudy Artanto and thereby sustain the determination of the West Los Angeles Area Planning Commission uh, in its approval of the specific plan exception uh, relative to the front yards um, of five feet in lieu of the 15 feet required by the transit neighborhood plan for the construction of the uh, single family dwellings um, and the parking spaces. I will call the row. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslav. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yeah. That's five members and that action is uh, denied the appeal. All right, what's next? Uh, item 14, sir, the categorical assumption from CEQA and the related findings, a report from the Planning Commission, an appeal filed by Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility Safer, which is uh, challenging the approval of the environmental clearance, the categorical exemption for the construction of a mixed use building with 125 dwelling units, 13 units set aside for extremely low income households. All right, we have a report from Department of City Planning. Good evening, council members. My name is Heather Bleemer, senior city planner with the LA City Planning, covering the CEQA appeal that is before you as council file 23-0816. This CEQA appeal is related to the director's approval of a mixed use building containing 125 dwelling units, of which 13 would be set aside for extremely low income households. And it also includes almost 4,000 square feet of commercial space. This was approved under the Transit Oriented Communities Incentive Program, or TOC. The appeal appellant, which is also safer, did appeal the site plan review approval to the City Planning Commission on June 8, 2023, stating the same appeal points that are before you today. The CPC denied the appeal and upheld the director's approval of the project. The project's environmental clearance is a class 32 infill exemption, which is specifically utilized for urban infill development, such as this project. The appeal contends that the city improperly approved the site plan review request for the project because the project does not qualify for a class 32 categorical exemption, because the project may have significant air quality issues and has also stated several is other issues with the class 32 as the reliance on the uh, CEQA project, on the, as the, excuse me, the project CEQA clearance. However, the city planning, our city planning has reviewed the appeal and concludes that there is no merit to the appeal and that the class 32 categorical exemption is the adequate environmental clearance for the project. The applicant's environmental consultant has also submitted additional justification documents to council file, which explain in greater detail why the dependence on this class 32 is um, 
the correct CEQA clearance for the project. The appellant did submit additional letters. Yesterday, I have reviewed those letters and I still believe that these letters lack any merit and do not raise any substantial evidence that the Class 32 is inadequate for this project. As such, City Planning believes that the project is entirely compatible with the surrounding community and will be beneficial and provide much needed housing for the community, including those 13 restricted affordable units. Uh, we also conclude that there is no merit to the appeal and therefore we recommend denial of this appeal before you. I am happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you. If there are uh, no questions for the committee, we'll call on the appellant. Hi, good afternoon, council members. Uh, I'll be quick. Again, my name is Marjan Abubo of Lozo Jury, and I'm here on behalf of SAFER um, and its members who live, work, and recreate in and around the city of LA. Regarding the project, um, a categorical exemption cannot apply where there is a reasonable possibility that the activity will have a significant effect on the environment due to unusual circumstances. And as explained in our earlier letters, SAFER objects to the use of the exemption because there are significant indoor air quality impacts such that the project will expose future residents and commercial employees to uh, formaldehyde emissions. Uh, the applicant has uh, responded and claimed that the project's materials would comply with the regulations set by CARB, but that's not the point. SAFER's expert already assumed that materials would meet these requirements and still found the impact to be significant. This impact can only be mitigated by going beyond the Air Board's regulations, which are a floor and not a ceiling, by requiring no formaldehyde added products to ensure the safety of future residents and employees. As such, the city is precluded from applying the Class 32 exemption and SAFER respectfully requests the city uh, to instead prepare an MND or an EIR. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll hear from the applicant. Good afternoon, commissioners. Andrew Brady of the DLA Piper firm on behalf of the applicant. Um, we're here before you on the same appeal you heard earlier today, you've heard dozens of times, uh, SAFER, Union Labor Organization, continues to raise the same formaldehyde issue that has been rejected time and time again by the city. The same argument was rejected here by the Planning Commission. It is entirely without merit. The indoor air issue is not a secret issue. The report that they put forth is an outdated report that does not relate to this project. It relates to single family houses built in 2017, does not account for updates to the building code, is completely in a posit. These issues have all been fully and completely addressed by staff, by the expert consultants who prepared the reports on this project. Their responses to the appeal have not been addressed at all by the appellant. Uh, this is an entirely repetitive and meritless appeal, and we request that it be rejected. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we will begin our consideration of this item by hearing from Councilmember Hutt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm asking for denial of the appeal. All right. Uh, denial, uh, a motion to deny has been put forward by Ms. Hutt. If we could read specific instructions to the record and call the roll. Uh, yes, uh, recommendations to deny the appeal filed by Supporters Alliance for Environmental Responsibility SAFER and thereby sustain the determination of the Planning Commission to approve the environmental clearance, the categorical exemption for, from CEQA for the construction of the mixed-use building with 125 dwelling units, including 13 units set aside for extremely low-income households. Project is situated as denoted on the agenda in CD10. I will call the roll. Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hunt. Yes. Uh, that's five. Uh, yes, and that appeal is denied, sir. All right. What's next? Um, it will be item number 15. This is a planning department report and an appeal filed by uh, the applicant appellant, Mr. Stephen Samuel, which is. Um, uh, filing an appeal relative to the planning department determination of an incomplete application for the 190 unit affordable housing development located at 7745 through 7751 North Wilbur Avenue in CD3. All right, we'll hear from uh, Department of City Planning. 
Good afternoon, Commissioners. Good afternoon, Council. Laura Frazen Steele, City Planner, Los Angeles City Planning. This is a Permit Streamlining Act appeal pursuant to Government Code Section 65943C for a 100% affordable 190 unit residential project at 7745 7751 North Wilbur Avenue in the Reseda West Van Nuys Community Plan. The appeal challenges city planning's incompleteness determinations for two density bonus applications. Case number EDM 2023-4428, DBED1VHCA, or the ADM application, and case number CPC 2023-4428, DBPHPVHCA or the CPC application and associated environmental case. Planning's incompleteness determinations and appeal responses are set forth in planning's communications to the council file. Planning highlights three points. First, this appeal addresses application completeness. An entitlement application is considered incomplete when materials are missing that make it unable to be processed. This appeal does not decide the merits of those applications, such as whether there is compliance with development standards. Two, the Permit Streamlining Act authorizes the city to create lists of information required from an applicant and then enforce those requirements by determining whether an application is incomplete. This is allowed because applications with missing information cannot be fully evaluated. Many of the items on the department's list of required materials are standardized forms. The appellant submitted an application dated June 28, 2023. Missing items were identified and the appellant was provided written notification on July 18, 2023. Subsequent to that, after the mayor clarified the emergency order and instructions set forth in Executive Directive 1, the project no longer qualified for ED1 processing and was, not, and was converted to the appropriate entitlement path. At no time was the project not given a path forward. Three, the appellant's, the appellant's claim that they are vested under the process streamlining provisions of Executive Directive 1. However, the processes in ED1 are enabled solely by the mayor's declaration of a state of emergency, which cannot be vested. The authority to declare a state of emergency and issue related executive directives in accordance with that emergency arises from the city charter and codes. Planning and zoning standards, regulations, procedures, and rules that are eligible for vesting through a preliminary application arise from planning and zoning laws in Title VII of the government code. There is no ability to vest an emergency when declared. An emergency exists for a limited duration and is subject to regular renewal or termination. It is also subject to and explicitly authorized to include modifications to respond to changing parameters and the emerging context of a declared emergency. Much like an earthquake, fire, or other natural disaster, the ability of the chief executive of the city to declare a state of emergency promulgate alternative rules and procedures for a limited time and update and assess those rules regularly is by definition the necessity of emergency powers granted to the government. A directive of this type does not carry with it the legislative intent of processes, procedures, and development regulations expected to be vested under the Housing Crisis Act. Finally, planning will process an application 
when the appellant makes an application complete. The appellant has not provided the missing application information in order to complete either the ADM application or the CPC application, and therefore, both applications remain incomplete. Until then, for the above reasons, planning recommends council deny the appeal and sustain planning's determinations that the applications are incomplete. We are available for questions. Thank you. All right. Um, if there is no discussion on this item, uh, Mr. Mejia, there's a motion to deny this appeal. We've, uh, just for a reminder, we heard from the applicant and appellant, appellant earlier in the meeting. Yes. Uh, so the recommendations to deny the appeal filed by Stephen Samuel, um, 7749 Wilbur Avenue Real Estate, LLL, the owner, um, and thereby sustain the, the, the September 18th, 2023, Planning Department determination of an incomplete application for the project located at 7745 through 7751 North Wilbur Avenue. Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. That's uh, five members and that appeal is denied. All right, what's next? Uh, that would be item 16, sir. Uh, it's an environmental impact report uh, and, and the final EIR for the Harvard Westlake River Park project and appeals filed by Studio City Residents Association and Save LA River Open Space and two, Save Wet Weddington Inc. from the determination of the Planning Commission as it relates to the approval of investing conditional use, site plant review, and environmental clearance, the EIR, for the redevelopment uh, and use of an athletic and recreational facility for the Harvard Westlake School in CD4. Good afternoon, Palm Committee. Kimberly Henry with City Planning. The project before you is the redevelopment of the existing Weddington Golf and Tennis Site to develop an athletic and recreation facility for use by the Harvard Westlake School and the public. On August 24th, 2023, the City Planning Commission considered the Harvard Westlake River Park project. At this meeting, the City Planning Commission approved a vesting conditional use and site plan review certified the Harvard Westlake River Park Project EIR and adopted the project's environmental findings, statement of overriding consideration and mitigation monitoring program. The commission's actions on the CPC case were, sub were subsequently appealed by the Studio City Residents Association and Save the LA River Open Space and Save Weddington. Staff has provided detailed written responses to each of these appeal points in an appeal response letter to Plum dated November 1st, 2023, which has been transmitted to the council file for your consideration. A summary of the appeal points are as follows. The project violates and fail to comply with CEQA, fails to comply with the Surplus Land Act, the vesting conditional use permit and site plan review were improperly approved and unsubstantiated, and that, the, that an incomplete application was submitted. Staff would like to clarify that the EIR fully and adequately analyzed the whole of the project. The project's compliance with the Surplus Land Act is a matter for the County of Los Angeles Flood Control District to consider and address, and the City Planning Commission made all of the necessary entitlement and environmental findings. Further, the application provided all of the necessary and required information, including special event information submitted to the Department of City Planning as part of the project application materials. Additionally, a letter was submitted today from Jamie Hall, the representative for one of the appellants, Save Weddington, alleging that the project, and specifically the gymnasium building, does not conform to the community plan footnote number six, which requires open, sa open space designation to conform to the definition of open space land per government code section 65560B, such that it remains essentially undeveloped. Staff would like to clarify that government code section 65560B3 allows for open space land to include open space for outdoor recreation, including but not limited to areas of outstanding scenic, historic and cultural value, and areas particularly suited for park and recreation purposes. As the majority of the project will be for outdoor athletic recreation and open space, the project is consistent with the community plan's definition of open space land. 
In conclusion, and as described in the appeal response letter, no substantial evidence has been presented in the appeals to dispute the findings of the EIR or the, or the City Planning Commission's actions on the related entitlement or entitlements, excuse me. Therefore, staff recommends that the Plum Committee deny the appeals and sustain the City Planning Commission's actions. That concludes my presentation and I am available for questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So now we will uh, hear from the appellant. Good evening, uh, Amy Mintier with Carstens Black and Mintier on behalf of the Appellant Studio City Residents Association and Save LA River Open Space. Uh, it has been a long day and you heard a lot of comments already today, so I'd like to start by just urging the committee to carefully consider the detailed comment letters, expert reports we have submitted regarding the impacts of this project, the inadequacies of the environmental review, and less impactful alternatives for this largest remaining unprotected open space area along the LA River within the San Fernando Valley. But also like to highlight a few of the community's greatest concerns. First is the excessive density of development and intensity of use for the site, including two athletic fields, a swimming pool, and massive gymnasium. Spreading this development across the entire site requires the removal of hundreds of mature trees adversely impacting birds, bats, and other wildlife, as well as significantly reduce, reduce, reducing carbon sequestration and visual degradation of a green oasis in a developed area of the city by replacing it with buildings and hardscape. It will also take decades for the proposed replacement trees to reach the size of existing mature trees. The 80-foot stadium lights will cause adverse night lighting impacts on the surrounding community and on wildlife species that rely on the adjacent Greenway and LA River. And the project also allows for on-site special events with up to 2,000 attendees with the use of amplified sound, which will have further noise and traffic impacts on the community. We would also like to ask uh, the committee to, for claims of usable public open space and ex access for this project to be carefully reviewed. There are significant financial and organizational barriers to the use of these facilities by the public. Only formally organized groups with set membership lists that have liability insurance and can pay the yet to be disclosed usage fees will be allowed to use the facilities, eliminating access opportunities for the majority of the community. We believe a reduced density and intensity of use alternative would substantially lessen many of the project's impacts while providing enhanced and more equitable use of the site of this unique site by the public. We also want to note that the applicant's revised plan that was touted today actually increases hardscape and building square footage on the site as opposed to reducing it. Um, further, this project continues to include artificial turf on the sports fields, despite clear expert evidence demonstrating the hazards associated with this turf, its heat island effect and water quality impacts on the LA River. The LA Legislature has recently recognized the harmful qualities of, tur of this turf due to its lack of recyclability and presence of toxins such as lead and PFAS. This element must be eliminated from the project. For all of these reasons, we urge you to grant our appeal and require further analysis, mitigation, and consideration of project alternatives before any development moves forward on this important site. Thank you. Thank you. We have an additional appeal from the Save Weddington Incorporated. Good evening. My name is Jamie Hall. I'm a land use and environmental attorney with Channel Law Group. I'm here representing Save Weddington. Uh, the first issue, one substantive, and then we're going to talk about some procedural issues. Um, substantive issue, the project does not conform to the definition of open space lands in Community Plan Note 6. That note requires that uh, land designated open space, such as the project site, shall conform to the definition of open space land in Government Code Article 10.5. This definition requires that open space land shall be essentially unimproved and devoted to an open space use as defined in the section. First, the existing portion of the project will no longer be essentially unimproved after the project constructs gymnasium, surface and subterranean parking level, turf field with bleachers, sprawling tennis courts, a swimming pool and vast associated paved and artificial surfaces. 
The mandate that open space lands shall be un essentially unimproved requires that the basic characteristics of the open space remains without permanent structures or buildings. Second, the proposed indoor gymnasium will no longer be devoted to an open space use as defined in the government code. Um, the uses of the project's indoor gymnasium fall clearly outside the scope of any of the six categories in the government code. Now to some really important procedural issues. The Planning Commission hearing was um, constitutionally infirm. It's fundamental that a biased decision maker is constitutionally unacceptable. Bias either actual or an unacceptable probability of it alone is enough on the part of a municipal decision maker to show a violation of due process. Here, two planning commissioners, President Samantha Millman and Vice President Carolyn Cho, have both demonstrated an unacceptable probability of actual bias. Each are alumni of Harvard-Westlake, and more significantly, each are donors to the school. According to Harvard-Westlake's own annual report, Ms. Millman contributed at least $10,000, and Ms. Cho contributed at least $25,000. None of these disclosures were made at the hearing, and both commissioners participated in that hearing. Moreover, both commissioners are, quote, Alumni affinity leaders, again, according to Harvard Westlake's own records. You need to grant this appeal, remand it back to the Planning Commission, and require those commissioners to recuse themselves so that a fair hearing can be required as the Constitution requires. This is not an optional thing. Um, and then they, I also want to point out that the city has routinely violated the Brown Act. The Brown Act provides that uh, an it for absolutely and stri strictly forbids any sharing of individual council members' comments or positions about items of business because the failure to uh, the, providing that information precludes public decision making in a public forum and we believe that the city has violated that essential Brown Act rule in the lead up to this hearing today. Um, so for all of those reasons, we request that you grant the appeal. Thank you so much. All right, uh, representing the applicant, the very able Mr. Edgar Kaladian. Uh, Mr. Chair and honorable members of the committee, my name is Edgar Kaladian with the Mayor Bound Law Firm and here today on behalf of the applicant, Harvard Westlake School. I am proud to be here today introducing you to River Park, a unique project in Studio City that is not only consistent with the city's policies and goals for shared spaces, recreation, sustainability, and education, but is a model for river revitalization, recognized as such by the LA River Cooperation Committee. River Park will repurpose a privately owned golf and tennis facility into a 17-acre site with a host of new recreational opportunities and environmental programming. River Park will not only serve Harvard Westlake students, but also provides access to community members and incredible organizations from across the city. From a community perspective, the project will provide significant benefits, including 5.4 acres of publicly accessible space seven days a week from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., no barriers to entry and no cost whatsoever, Anyone can use the space, whether it is to throw a frisbee at the pocket park or to walk their dog along the three-quarter of a mile pedestrian path that circumnavigates the property. Construction of an ADA-accessible pedestrian ramp from the Zev Greenway to River Park, enhancing the site as part of the green belt that the city has spent millions of dollars constructing along the LA River. In addition to the 5.4 acres of community space, River Park includes access to field, pool, and gym-based sports, and most notably eight tennis courts that will also uh, be used by the public. The project also features a river room, which will be used by environmental organizations to offer publicly accessible educational programming and cultural experiences related to the role of the LA River in the city's evolution. Finally, as part of our commitment to the community and consistent with our mission as a school, we have already entered into partnerships with six impactful organizations to ensure equitable use of the property. Our comprehensive partnership with Folar will make River Park the organization's valley home for educational and cultural programs promoting nature, sustainability, and access to the LA River. Our partnership envisions frequent LAUSD field trips to learn about conservation and a fellows program that will offer vocational training to high school students. Our partnership with the Fernandinho Tatavium Band of Mission Indians will help develop and install educational monuments calling attention to the history and culture of indigenous peoples and how their values and knowledge are a part of life today. Publicly available cultural experiences are at the core of the school's partnership with the tribe. We have also entered into a partnership with Angel City Sports, a vibrant and inspirational LA-based nonprofit that provides year-round adaptive sports opportunities for kids and adults with physical disabilities or visual impairments. 
Every facet of River Park is being developed to accommodate adaptive sports athletes, including the gym, track, and swimming pool. And finally, we have entered into partnerships with the Special Olympics, the Boys and Girls Club of Burbank and Greater East Valley, and the U.S. Tennis Association of Southern California for use of our facilities. All wonderful, transformative partners in their own right, and together, we'll make public use of River Park the majority of all activity on site. From an environmental perspective, the project includes significant benefits too. River Park will only use landscaping that is compliant with the city's, city's Rio design guidelines. Beautiful species that will restore the site's ecosystem, welcoming back a huge array of native flora and fauna. Instead of the 12 million gallons of potable water that the current site requires, the carefully designed landscape program will consume a fraction of that total. Of the 215 trees that will be removed, almost half have been specifically by name identified by the city as never to be planted along the LA River and a full 70% are not compliant with the city's Rio guidelines. River Park will plant more than 350 new California native trees. As a result of the landscaping plan, River, River Park will see an increase in carbon sequestration starting year three. And over the lifetime of the project's replacement trees, almost a four-fold increase as compared to the existing trees. River Park also includes a 350,000 gallon water reclamation and reuse system to treat water that is collected on site. Following treatment, Reclaimed water would be stored in an underground cistern to be used for on-site irrigation. With the exception of two ki commercial kitchens and the swimming pool, the entire project will be built all electric. River Park will also have two sports fields, both of which feature artificial turf as a more sustainable solution compared to natural grass. For instance, just at River Park, using turf fields will save over 5 million gallons of water annually. The turf will not require any pesticides or fertilizers, and using turf will allow the public access and almost no downtime. Furthermore, this year, at the behest of various environmental organizations, the California legislature passed AB 1423, which would have regulated the use of certain chemicals, called PFAS, in the production of artificial turf. Though the governor recently vetoed the legislation for justifiable reasons, Harvard Westlake has voluntarily agreed to abide by the vetoed legislation. With regards to the appeals, the vesting CUP and site plan review findings are supported by substantial evidence and the appellants have failed to provide any evidence to suggest otherwise. The mere fact that individuals do not like the project does not mean that the project is inconsistent with the community plan or that the project will degrade neighboring properties. To the contrary, we agree with the, with the city that River Park is not only consistent with our relevant city policies, it will enhance the surrounding community. River Park is consistent with the community plan, the city's municipal code, and all relevant plans and policies, which is evidenced by the fact that we have not requested a general plan amendment, a zone change, or a single variance from any rule or regulation. The, poise, the points raised in the appeals are generally the same points raised by the appellants to the draft EIR, and the city thoroughly responded to each comment in the final EIR, and again in the department's appeal response dated November 1, 2023. In conclusion, we concur with city staff that the appeals are without merit and should be denied. Furthermore, the administrative record, including the EIR and relevant testimony, contains substantial evidence supporting the city's certification of the EIR. Thank you, and we respectfully request your support. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll now hear from Council District 4. <laughs> okay. Last speaker before you are all on your merry way. Hopefully, um, thank you so much, honorable council members. Good afternoon still. Uh, Michelle Majid, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for Council District 4. Um, while this effort predates council member Rahman's time in office by many years, we are encouraged by the high level of engagement for the significant development proposal and worked hard to ensure that this project was treated with care and attention. We inherited a project that went through many changes in the last decade under contentious circumstances at times. Occupied by a private nine-hole, 27-par golf course and tennis facility, the site was purchased by Howard Westlake School from the family that owned and operated Weddington Golf and Tennis in 2017 for the purpose of redesigning, building, and opening and operating an athletic and recreational facility for the school students and the general public. The sale and purchase took place after previous proposals for the 16-acre property by the Weddington family, such as one which included preser preservation of golfing and tennis on the site while adding Senior housing units failed to move forward because of community opposition to adding any housing to the site. Though the previous owners no longer found it feasible to operate the site under its existing uses and the city can't afford to purchase it, we empathize with people in the neighborhood who feel a palpable emotional connection to the golf and tennis facilities. It has been a part of their community for generations. 
for generations. We proactively met with Howard Westlake School to raise issues and recommendations but put, brought forward by community members such as ways to address shared public use facilities access, increase publicly accessible green space on site, reduce the scale, improve pedestrian safety, enhance the public realm, activate transportation demand management strategies, limit special events, promote green building and environmental protections, and reduce traffic noise and construction impacts, and pushed for amenities that can honor the recreational legacy of this property. On August 14th, we provided the City Planning Commission with a detailed letter that proposed multiple requests with the hope that these can be turned into binding enforceable conditions in a future letter of determination, a request that was honored by the school and the City Planning Commission. Our office was able to achieve the following as detailed in the current letter of determination. Ensuring that the publicly accessible green space portion of the property is usable Monday through Sunday from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. and that no Harvard Westlake associated athletic events, practices, or games will take place on Sundays. Decreasing the overall, overall number of on-site events from close to 30 down to 20. No football games at this proposed site. Formalizing a clear process to access public use facilities, including the tennis courts, pool, athletic fields, running track, and gymnasium that maximizes access for individuals in addition to community-based organization. Removing the proposed three-foot high fence along Valley Spring Lane and Beller Avenue to ensure the site feels open and approachable. Um, improving and maintaining the Xavier Zofsky LA River Greenway Trail on the north side um, of the LA River. Replacing the decomposed granite in the outdoor open courtyard adjacent to the clubhouse um, with uh, natural grass and landscaping to create a new publicly accessible pocket park. Installing a new controlled pe pedestrian crosswalk and a continuous ADA accessible public walkway with new wayfinding site signage between the southwest corner of Valley Heart North Drive, Woodset Avenue and the entrance of the Xavier Sofsky LA Greenway Trail. Constructing carbon-free buildings and using electric engine shuttles between the upper campus and the project site. Um, prohibiting the rental lease or use of the property other than by Harvard Westlake, its rel related organizations, as well as filming on the property for commercial related purposes. Expanding on our city's um, enforceable good neighbor construction policies and coordinating construction activities with neighboring projects to ensure minimal disruption in the area. While comprehensive, we found these requests to not be as inclusive as we had hoped for in the determination letter. Therefore, our office would like to respectfully propose the following voluntary requests as were read into the record at the beginning of this meeting um, for your consideration. So just to summarize, these included um, having individual access to some of the facilities, including field B and the pool. Um, it also included uh, that on federal holidays, um, school activities, athletic or otherwise, are limited to indoor use uh, and can only occur from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it also added a new condition confirming no Olympic-related events, including athletic games or otherwise, at the project site. Our office is grateful for the good faith collaboration among our constituents, community partners, city departments, Harvard Westlake School, and all who work diligently to get us to this pivotal stage. We're committed to making sure that Harvard Westlake School follows through on being a responsible and responsive owner and developer and look forward to working with residents to ensure that the site becomes part of a new chapter for our community we can all be proud of. We respectfully ask for your support in a denial of the appeals. Thank you. Thank you. So you're banning the Olympics from this <laughs> place? Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, any other discussion on, the, on this item, members? All right, so uh, we have uh, some amendments that have been put forward uh, by Council District 4, mm -hmm. um, and we have a recommendation to deny the appeal and include these uh, amendments. If you could read those into the record and call the roll. Uh, yes, so the recommendation, sir, is to deny the appeals filed by Studio City Residents Association and Save LA River Open Space and the Save Weddington Inc and thereby sustain the recommendation of the Planning Commission relative to the approval of the vesting conditional use, the site plan review, and the environmental clearance, the environmental impact report, the statement of overriding considerations, the mitigation monitoring program, and related CEQA findings for the redevelopment 
of um, and use as an athletic and recreational facility for the Harvard Westlake School, subject to modified conditions of approval and inclusive of um, the amendments to conditions 20 and 18 and the addition of uh, a new condition as reflected in a letter dated November the 7th, uh, 2023 from Council District 4 and as uh, read into the record by the planning deputy for CD4 at today's meeting. And I will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Mr. Lee. Hi. Ms. Yaroslavsky. You read those into the record, and inclusive of the planning amendment that was read at the beginning of the meeting uh, today. And so, in, having made that change, Mr. Harris Dawson. Yes. Uh, Mr. Lee. Aye. Ms. Yaroslavsky. Yes. Ms. Padilla. Yes. Ms. Hutt. Yes. That concludes the meeting, and that item All right. was denied. Thank you so much. We're adjourned. Thank you so yes. much, everyone.